It's been an awful lot of days since I did a video last. Uh, I think I just really haven't had anything to 
talk about really. I mean, it's I, I don't know how many days it's been, but it's I, maybe a few months or something like that. And uh, it's been an awful lot of just you know repetitive, boring, dull days. You know, kind of doing the same thing every day, finding food, trying to stay warm, trying to not cross paths with people, um, trying to keep it dull because uh, I like dull. Uh, I remember you know back when this stuff all first started going down I remember my um, my exciting days <laughs> and they um, they sucked I, um, I I think the last yeah it was the last time I crossed paths with a person it was awful it was worse for them than it was for me but still it sucks and um, I'm trying to keep my days nice and nice and dull uh, I uh, I have made a couple of trips into uh, you know, some houses, there's like a suburb down this way, a few few miles through the woods, but there's some houses kind of on the edge, and I, I've gone into those, I've, I've pulled some food, some other kind of supplies out. I got a pair of scissors, and I've been using that to, to keep this down a little bit. Um, I guess if I let it grow out, it would keep me warmer, but um, I know it gets itchy, and um, I like to think that, you know, this isn't the end, and maybe someday we go back to some kind of a normal, so um, I don't want to turn into a total mountain man recluse at this point, but yeah. A um, uh, couple of times when I was in there, I was thinking, you know, it's a nice roof over your head. Like, should I move things and stay over there? But uh, yeah, I'm just trying to not cross paths with people because uh, I think people are probably pretty universally nasty right now. And I'm just trying to just stay away from all that. And uh, I don't know, just I don't know, lay low at least for the winter and you know, see what happens with that. Um, just keeping things boring, really. In fact, the only reason I'm doing a video today, right now, is um, is this up here. Uh, it's uh, it's been cloudy forever. A um, lot of lot of snow coming through, and I haven't seen the sky for a while. I mean, you can see the ships kind of through the clouds a little bit, and a little. What did Monica used to call them? Hud suckers, or but I forget what you call them. the little drone things. Um, I can't remember what you call them. But, uh, yeah, you see those things. But I haven't seen the sky in forever. And you know, just this morning, it's a clear day. It's cold and windy, but it's clear. And, well, this is something new that uh, I have not seen that before. I'm, uh, I I'm not sure how the hell that happened. But that is, that's not cool. It felt kind of nice doing the video yesterday. I mentioned that I hadn't done one in a while. I was kind of preoccupied with, you know, all the not dying stuff. But, uh, I don't know, it feels good to kind of talk about things. So I thought maybe I'd, I'd start doing this again. Uh, I don't want to blab on and on about the moon, though. You know, that is what it is. Um, I figured uh, what's really on my mind today, in terms of nuts and bolts of that, all that you know, not dying stuff, is um, you know, staying warm, staying warm, and you know, keeping enough calories in your body to keep going. Uh, yesterday was pretty brisk out. Today uh, we had a bunch of rain last night. In fact, you can see. I mean, there's pretty much nothing left for snow on top of the the shelter, uh, and it's feeling really comfortable uh, at the moment. Uh, you know, the way spring is here in New England, you know, you can have warm days and cool days and back to, I mean, who knows, it could be like 20 degrees tomorrow. Um, so I'm still thinking about keeping warm, but it's nice to know that spring is kind of coming on its way. Uh, what I've been doing to keep warm uh, is, uh, you know, just all old Yankee New England tricks for staying warm in the winter. Uh, you know, if you're camping outside and it's cold out, you know, it's always going to be a challenge. And uh, what I've been doing is layering. I've got a lot of layers on. Uh, you know, it looks like I'm wearing kind of a, a coat and some pants. But, you know, this coat is one layer. I can do this because it's warm now. This coat is one layer over this uh, the sweatshirt that I, I came into. Uh, and under the sweatshirt is another t-shirt. Uh, I think I picked this one up at some of the, uh, the houses over here. And then under this is uh, actually, well, this is a shirt off my back. 
<laughs> that I left my house in. Uh, the pants also are the, you know, the pants on my legs that I, I wore uh, out of the house. If I knew when I was fleeing my house, when I was doing it, that uh, I was going to have to be wearing what I was wearing at that time for an extended period of time in the winter, I might have chosen something other than blue jeans. Uh, blue jeans are one of the worst things that you can wear out in cold weather. They get wet. As soon as they get wet, you start feeling the cold right through them. I mean, they've, they're what I've got, so I'm wearing them, but uh, you know, well, even with these, I've got layers underneath these guys. I've got uh, a layer of uh, uh, sweatpants. Again, I picked these up from some of the the suburbs over there. I've got some socks that my uh, sweatpants are uh, tucked into. Inside these socks is another layer of socks in these. It's good to keep rotating your socks. You don't want to get damp, cold feet, so, so that's important. Uh, but really, uh, keeping layers on is a great way of, uh, you know, taking clothes. Well, these are t-shirts, um, but, you know, it's, you know, it's warmer today, but it's still kind of cool. But having these t-shirts on, having two layers of them, you know, just having the layers of summer clothes can make you a lot more comfortable, even though these aren't designed for winter weather. Having this plus, you know, heck, this sweatshirt, this isn't like necessarily a cold or winter kind of thing, but having all these layers on together keeps you nice and warm because you have all those layers. The most challenging time, though, honestly, is not daytime, it's nighttime. The, the temperatures really dip when you're camping outside in the middle of the night. And uh, that's the time you really have to be careful. Now, the shelter that I built here, there is a small wood stove that I built in there, and that really felt great. I mean, that brought heat into the space. Uh, the rocks around the wood stove, you know, heated up while I was running it. And that has been a great asset, especially just when you're working outside, you get your hands in the snow, and, uh, you know, it's cold. So it's nice to have an actual fire, you know, you can... Uh, warm up next to. But, you know, that in and of itself I didn't think was going to be sufficient, so I used some other techniques. One of them was actually using some of these juice bottles. Uh, I found that if I filled these juice bottles with uh, really hot water, uh, you know, not boiling water because, you know, the plastic of these bottles starts deforming when you put boiling water in it, but if I put some really hot water in these guys and then bundled up in there and had these kind of right up against me, uh, that was really helpful to try to take all the heat energy that I could take right off of a fire and put it inside my, my clothes. I found out on the first night though that you really got to make sure that they're held this way and not this way because especially once you put hot water into these things, these seals aren't good for anything. So I found out really quickly you got to make sure that these things stay vertical otherwise you get wet and then that's a disaster because you get, well it wasn't a disaster but it's really uncomfortable. Uh, you get wet and it's cold and that's a problem. Uh, so if you're uh, going to do something like this, you have to make sure that you're keeping them vertical uh, and you know, making sure that they're not leaking on you. But these were really, really great. A lot of heat energy can be packed into the water in a bottle like that and that's great. Um, the way to keep that uh, heat in your body, though, again, is to keep you dry while you're uh, in a uh, winter camping environment and to keep you warm with more layers. So, you know, the same way that I'm trying to keep myself dry on my body and uh, warm on my body, I'm using the same technique when I'm in there. And it starts from the ground. Uh, and when you lay on the ground, uh, there's always... Uh, kind of moisture just venting up from the ground. The ground is a moist environment and whether it's coming up as an actual puddle like in this, you know, sometimes there'd be a little water that would run in or even just the humidity of the ground, you want to have some kind of a vapor barrier. And there's a bunch of different things that I've used to do that um, and they've gotten better and better as I've been doing my runs in here. I started off with just things like trash bags. Uh, you know, and trash bags are okay but they're really thin. Uh, but I would use some trash bags, lay them down and that created a really nice vapor barrier on the ground in here. Um, uh, after the trash bags, I graduated to some of these old ripped up, it's like, uh, I don't know, like landscaping plastic and stuff. This was a, a lot tougher, um, but still it would get some holes in it. Um, but, you know, I would just layer all this stuff onto, you know, more layers of this stuff. And the great thing is the more of these plastic layers you're putting in, you're getting little air uh, cavities trapped between them and you're creating a little bit of insulation as well. Uh, the coup de gras, is that it? Coup de gras or coup d'etat? I don't remember. I could look it up on my, my phone, but I, <laughs> I don't have it and it's not working. Um, well, the, uh, the final blow, as the French would say, was this beautiful garish uh, shower curtain, again, on one of my runs. It's like a six or an eight mil vinyl, and this has been really great. I just laid this down in there, and this, uh, like, there's no water 
uh, just bubbling up through this thing. This was a really great find, and I'm glad that I found that. And it really it spruces up the place, brings a little color uh, into the interior. Um, so that stuff was really great as a vapor barrier in there, so that when I'm laying down, I don't end up lying down in a puddle and my back doesn't get all damp. Because, you know, if you're out and you sit down on the grass or something like that, you know, you don't even notice it, but then you get up and your butt's wet. So that, that kind of moisture can wick up slowly and it can become a real problem. Uh, the next layer that I used was uh, some kind of an insulating layer. Now, oh God, if I could have found some like yoga mats or something like that in there, I'm still looking for yoga mats. That'd be pretty awesome. But what I have found is all these plastic mail mailers that people would get like Amazon stuff or whatever in. Uh, you know, they're trash, but they're gold at this point. I've got tons of these in there and I just took these and you know put down my vapor barrier and then just scattered these over it in a nice uh, layered pile. Now these are an additional vapor barrier because they're plastic. Uh, on top of that, they are padding because you know it's squishy bubble pack here, uh, really comfortable. And uh, the third benefit that they have is insulation because you've got all these trapped air spaces in there. So you put this up against a cool, cool ground. Uh, oh man, it's like I said, this stuff. This stuff here is gold. On top of that, I would just uh, put uh, some blankets. I did get some blankets. Also some, well, I got one right here. Uh, just some towels. You know, uh, towels seem like, you know, not the kind of thing you're gonna go, you know, wrapping yourself up in, in bed with. But you know, you have a, a few of these. In fact, these were some of my first finds. You have a few of these and they become shawls and it makes a huge difference just having these extra layers on. So on top of the vapor barrier, I would put the foam padding and then myself all layered up having this hot water bottle in there with me and kind of bundling blankets and eventually, uh, I'm sorry, towels and eventually I did find some blankets uh, in there. And then what I would do, because uh, this structure itself did occasionally have some little drips and things, I took one of my tarps and I would kind of throw a tarp over, over the whole thing just to, if I did have some drips coming down on, them, on me, they wouldn't be absorbing right into my warming layers, they would be being absorbed uh, or, you know, shed off by the uh, the tarp. So that's what I've been doing and it's, you know, it's worked out okay. You camp outside in the winter and it's it's uncomfortable. I mean, there's no way around that. It's going to be uncomfortable, but you do the best with it you, that you can. And if you keep yourself covered in layers, have some kind of like a heat source that you can bring in with you, hot water. People talk about heating up stones. You can heat up stones by the fire, but you start putting stones around the fire and if they've got water in them, they can quickly turn into hand grenades because uh, especially like river stones, you, you take a river stone or put it in the uh, in or near the fire, the water that's on the inside of that stone is going to boil and then the thing can explode and I didn't want to mess with that. So just having the hot water uh, was a really nice asset. So I feel like we've gotten through the worst of the winter here and uh, you know I'm looking forward to you know this next season being spring and uh, there's definitely some improvements I want to make. I, I don't know how long all this is going to go, but I'd rather plan for it being longer than I would like, than, you know, hope that it's going to be really short and not, you know, plan ahead enough and, you know, be in trouble later on. So I'm planning as though this could, who knows how long this is going to go on for. So uh, this season I want to do some upgrades to this uh, structure to make it even more livable. Um, uh, certainly with water shedding, I, do, I did put some uh, plastic bag layers uh, underneath some of these uh, you know, pine boughs, but I want to maybe do something that has more of that water shedding, because like I said, I was getting some dripping happening on the inside. Um, and I also want to get a more reliable food source. Uh, I've been fairly... Food has come into my lap fairly serendipitously for the entire uh, experience since I've been out here, and I don't like relying on serendipity to keep me alive. Uh, you know, the pickings in town are getting slimmer and slimmer. I'm trying not to go in there. Uh, in the spring, there is going to be more wild edible stuff here. I'm hoping there's going to be more game so that I can find, you know, some animals uh, to, to go after. My uh, supplies are starting to get, you know, I still, I'm, I'm still doing okay, but, you know, every day there's a little bit less. So another thing I'd like to try, uh, based on another score that I had in town here, is that I'm going to be doing some gardening. Um, there is a field just down over here, and there's a stream kind of right next to it. So I want to take some of the nice earth from the forest, uh, bring it down over there into the field. The field didn't look like it was the best soil. And I'd like to start growing some crops based on some seeds that I scored in town over there. Uh, there were pumpkins. Um, what else was there? I forget. I just, I just grabbed like, there was a big pile of seed packs and I was just like, okay, I'm in, I'll, I'll grab those. And I've been trying to keep those dry for
for the entire winter. If circumstances were anything different than what they are, I'd probably actually be fairly enthusiastic and excited about some of the projects. Now, I guess I am looking forward to them because they're going to increase my quality of life and my uh, survivability uh, in a lot of cases. And like, how much do you even really want to think about that? Like preparing this for next winter. I mean, who wants to think that this is going to go on for that long, but who knows? And I'd rather personally be over prepared and put in more work than I had to, but you know, take that as insurance versus not being prepared enough. And well, I was almost in that situation over this last winter and it was just, just because of trash that I was able to survive. A lot more rain last night. Uh, not much snow left at this point. I think maybe if we have another another couple nights like we've had, you know, it's going to be back to bare ground, and then I'll be able to start looking for new wild edible shoots coming up out of the ground. So I'm excited about that. But one thing that I'm most excited about at this point is that it's been a really rough winter in terms of well, you know, there's the basic health uh, stuff of keeping your, yourself warm and keeping uh, calories in your body. But there are all sorts of other things you, uh, in terms of you know your health and your well-being that you have to keep on top of. And one of the big challenges this winter uh, was uh, skin care, you know, keeping my skin clean so I wouldn't get rashes. In fact, one of the big deals uh, is my feet because uh, you know they're pretty much always in boots. Uh, I try to you know keep them warm and dry whenever I, I could, but uh, you know it's hard, especially in the winter. I uh, I've always been prone to getting athlete's foot when I have my feet stuck in boots all the time. And uh, one of the, the big ways that I've been able to avoid that this year, again, is just trying to keep my feet warm and dry whenever I've been able to do that. Uh, and I've also been uh, tapping some things that were in my bug out bag. Uh, I've always had a medical kit in my bug out bag. Uh, right here, as a matter of fact. And it's got all sorts of uh, you know, different helpful items, and some of them have been real lifesavers. Uh, I think the most important things that I've uh, had in here just for you know this past winter have been uh, Neosporin. When I've gotten a cut or something and I didn't want to risk it possibly getting infected, I was able to put Neosporin on my cut, and it just gave me that peace of mind and probably the the actual uh, sanitizing benefit of uh, knowing that I was uh, cleaning out that wound, it was going to heal faster and there was less likely of getting an infection. Uh, getting an infection out in an environment like this could be really bad. You know, if you don't have access to antibiotics or whatever, uh, that can take a, you know, situation from, you know, totally fine to emergency uh, pretty quickly. So Neosporin was something that I had in here that was really uh, helpful for me. Another thing that's been really helpful, and I'll just kind of fold, uh, fold out through some of this stuff, was uh, things for uh, you know, general skin care. I've got this Burt Bees uh, ointment, which was really great if I had an abrasion or my hands were just getting really dry, either from working with the fire or being cold and just the cold, dry air of the winter. Having some kind of an ointment that you can put on your skin to prevent it from cracking is another benefit, not just to keep you you know, more comfortable because nobody likes to have dry cracking skin. But if you do get dry cracking skin, that's a vector for bacteria or, you know, uh, infection to, uh, to get into your body. So having some way of preventing dry cracked skin, I think was really important. And another thing which I mentioned uh, relates to the fact that I sometimes get athlete's foot uh, uh, is I, I've i always kept uh, some uh, gold bond uh, foot powder in my bag just for that exact reason. I've always been kind of prone to getting uh, athlete's foot. Um, I don't know what it is with me, but whenever my feet are in a cold, dark environment, uh, you know, shit happens. <laughs> so I've always tried to uh, prep against that. Um, you know, just toasting them by the fire is really great uh, for helping them to get dried off. But it's really helpful if I have a system for trying to keep them dry when I can't have my feet nice and warm and cozy by the fire. And uh, what I've developed is this. So the way that I start is I just take some of the foot powder and rub it right into my toes. I'm trying to not waste any of it because obviously you only have so much of it. Just getting it everywhere between the toes, all around, and maybe a little bit on the pad of the foot as well. And then what I do is I take one of these napkins, which I was fortunate enough to come across. These I had actually not kept in my kit, though I think in the future I probably would begin keeping these. 
fold them in half and I just weave them between my toes just like this. And bring that flap over there, tuck that over like that. It's a nice little package at this point. And then I'm gonna take the sock and just slide the sock right on, keeping it all together like that. And I'll do that on the other foot as well. Just getting some on there again, trying to minimize waste between the toes. all over. It's much easier to prevent a problem usually like this than to solve it after the fact. So getting it all around there. And I used to do just foot powder. You know, I said I've been kind of prone for a while to getting athlete's foot. I used to do only foot powder and it was helpful. But doing the foot powder plus the napkin or paper towel works also. Doing the combination I found was really, really beneficial. Just wrapping it around all those toes. I don't, I don't wrap this toe because this toe is separated from all the other toes anyway. So keep it like that. And you just fold your sock on up over all of that and keeping it all nice and tight around your feet. That makes a huge difference when you have to be putting your feet back into boots to have that kind of dry uh, environment down in there if you have to have your feet in a dark, cold, damp environment. Another thing that's been really important is just keeping your whole body clean. I mean, it feels good to get your, uh, the dirt off your body, your oils off your body, your dead skin off your body. But if you don't do those things, it can result in all sorts of skin rashes and things. So I've really made sure that I've tried to keep up with my hygiene. Uh, now, during the winter, it's kind of hard to take a comfortable shower and warm water is always going to be the best for washing off body oils. So I've created this little pan, which I use to heat up water over the fire, and I just use a cloth, in fact, this is a piece of cloth right here, um, to go and clean myself off. Uh, whenever I've been doing that, you always want to start with the top of your body, your face, and then kind of work your way down uh, so that you're starting, you know, in the areas that are kind of the cleanest and then moving to the dirtiest. You really want to end with your butt, <laughs> you know, to put it uh, kind of crassly. Uh, you don't want to wash your butt and then bring the cloth up to your face. And you, know, you do the best that you can with that. Having the warm water helps a lot because it makes it more comfortable and it makes it more effective. Um, but you know, whatever you can do to try to keep your body clean and um, sanitary is a really important uh, thing to do, especially if you're gonna be out in the woods for extended periods of time. Beyond that, also trying to keep my clothes clean, uh, washing them whenever I have been able to and letting them uh, dry out outside. Uh, I was always a big proponent of line drying clothes, you know, back when I had great things like a house, uh, people would always say, oh, you're kind of nuts because you don't use a dryer. What do you do in the wintertime? Well, if you take damp clothes or wet clothes and you put them outside, even in the dead of winter, unless you're having, you know, snow and sleet every single day, if you have days that are reasonably dry, after a couple of days, your clothes dry. That's just the way it is. And if you want to accelerate that, you can put it near the fire. And uh, also uh, having the smoke from the fire, uh, it kind of gives them a nice kind of rustic campfire uh, smell to them. And I I, I like to think that uh, the smoke would be uh, antiseptic in some way because it sure feels uh, toxic to life when it's going in my face and my eyes. <laughs> so I like to think that uh, you know whatever critters might be trying to make a home move in on my, my clothes are going to feel the same kind of awfulness if I'm smoking my clothes as well. So that's what I've been doing all winter long. It's been a it's been rough living in somewhere that's not the most hygienic environment and trying to keep yourself clean and sanitary. It's challenging, but it was made a lot easier for me uh, because I had this simple bag of basic medical items. And I'll go into a couple of the other things that I have in here as well. I noted a few that I found really helpful over the winter. Another one that was helpful is hand sanitizer. I think having hand sanitizer is certainly a benefit. And I think, you know, if there's anything that would never be politicized and everyone could agree on, it'd be good hygiene and keeping yourself free of germs and disease. I can't imagine any circumstances where any, anybody could uh, disagree on that. Uh, other things uh, I have in here is you know, just simple bandages. Uh, I also have uh, cough drops. If I ever had a sore throat, uh, you know, you don't want to be uh, having a, a persistent cough. So if you can have some cough drops that will keep you from coughing, it can make it so that, you know, if you were going to have something develop into a worse sort of uh, coughing situation, you know, pneumonia or whatever, you can try to prevent that by having cough drops to kind of soothe your throat and not get into the point where you're actually doing damage to yourself by coughing. 
Uh, other things in here, just basic soap. Obviously that came in uh, handy while I was doing bathing. Uh, nail clippers are in here, tweezers are in here. Those are really helpful. I'm More than one occasion I've had to implement the tweezers and bring those out. Uh, so just having a basic kit of basic health and sanitary items I think has gone a long way to take this experience and make it a lot more survivable. Another important aspect of personal hygiene is keeping your teeth clean. Now, I had the foresight to put toothpaste and a toothbrush in my backpack. That was always in my bug out bag. I also have dental floss in there. But those things are only gonna last so long. So whenever I can, I'm using things from the natural environment to keep my teeth clean. And one great resource is Willow. This is a little twig of will Willow. If you're ever looking for Willow, a great place to look for it is near streams and things. It likes wet soil uh, and I'm going to take a little piece of this off, just use a knife to slice a little bit off. And then what I'm going to do is just take some of the, uh, the bark just off the tip, off here. So that's going to leave me with just the stick. And then I'm going to take the stick and kind of chew on it a little bit. And what I'm doing while I'm chewing on it is I'm taking all the fibers and kind of splaying them all out, kind of fraying them out almost to make like a brush. There are also natural tannins in willow that uh, are uh, antimicrobial and they're going to help clean your teeth too. So at this point I'm starting to get kind of a brush end here and I can take this and use that to kind of polish up my teeth a little bit. You really want to make sure you're not losing little bits of the, uh, the inner bark and everything in your mouth because then that's stuff to have to floss out later. But it does make a nice, a nice little brush here. If you do go out looking for willow, be aware that if you can't identify it, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't want to just go randomly sticking plants in your mouth. Plants have a lot of benefits that they can share with us, but some of them are toxic, some of them are deadly, and you don't want to mess with that. So if you don't know what you're dealing with, definitely don't put it in your mouth. Another thing that I find when I come out here all the time is that it's a great view of the sky and that has been sitting there for the better part of a week, I think at least. Usually they're moving. I'm not sure if there's something over there that might be worth checking out or avoiding. Everybody knows that one of the most important resources for human beings is water. Now throughout the winter I had really easy access to reasonably clean water. Uh, there was snow everywhere and I could melt that snow and I could drink it. Now the snow fell down through a polluted atmosphere and you know it's not absolutely pristine but it was pretty darn good and it served me well. But now that the snow's gone I need to get back to drinking out of things like streams and puddles and things like that and I need to have a good way of purifying the water. I have been using uh, this little device a little bit, and this is in my bug out bag. Uh, it's a, a survivor filter, it's a, you know, the one brand was called Life Straw that was pretty popular. Uh, the idea with these is that there's a little spout, you can put your mouth on the end, and you put it uh, into a container of dirty water or like, you know, even literally right down into a stream, and you can drink water out and it's going to filter it, uh, you know, as you're drinking it, and it can keep you from getting sick. The, so they're pretty convenient, but the downside is that they don't last that long. The, the actual filtering element in this is pretty small. It plugs up pretty quickly, especially if the water that you're drinking is, you know, not pristine. So uh, this is something that, while it's helpful, I need to have a better long-term solution to get lots of water, you know, clean for myself. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is building a large filter that is going to do some, uh, some basic filtering of water. It's not going to be good enough to uh, kill viruses and bacteria, or not kill, but trap or you know, block viruses and bacteria, but it's going to take really dirty water and make it pretty clean, and then I'll be able to sanitize it the rest of the way on the fire. Uh, you might say, well, if you're going to have to boil your water anyway, why even bother with filtering it? Well, if you're boiling water, uh, you're going to be killing pathogens, bacteria, things of that nature that are in the water, but you're not going to eliminate things like chemical contamination. In fact, if you're boiling water and some of the water evaporates, you could actually be concentrating chemicals that are in there. So the filter I'm going to be building is something that's going to get rid of uh, particles that are in the water and get rid of uh, chemicals and things that are in the water, and then we'll get rid of the last of the pathogens by boiling it. 
The way that I'm going to be doing it is uh, by using a bucket. Uh, buckets are super useful. Uh, you know, I can't say enough about them from survivor caches to, you know, storing all sorts of different things. Buckets are really, really, uh, you know, they're a wonderful asset and it kills me. Uh, what I'm about to do with this one is I'm going to put a hole in the bottom. I'm going to be using this as the basic, uh, you know, form for my filter. I'm going to put one hole in the bottom. Uh, that's kind of a big decision because, you know, it's not like I can just run down to the hardware store and get another bucket, but uh, this is going to be a really useful uh, item and it's worth sacrificing one bucket to do it. Uh, before I do that, I just want to mention I built a little stand here uh, that's beneath the bucket. Uh, this is to hold it up off the ground. You can't just have the bucket sitting straight on the ground. You need it held up because I'll be able to put a cup or a can or any kind of a container under here and it'll catch the water that drips through. So I built this little stand to kind of keep it elevated up off the uh, ground here. So I'm just going to take a knife and I'm making a small hole, maybe about eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch in diameter. Just being very careful. All right, and the next step I'm going to do is I'm going to take this paper clip, which I've bent off to the side, and put it down through there. And what that'll do is make it so that when water does go through here, it doesn't just spread out on the bottom of the bucket. Uh, it'll act as a little drip guide to have the water drip straight down. Uh, the next step is that what I want to do is I want to uh, put some kind of a blockage so that uh, the particles that I'm going to be putting in here, which is going to be sand and charcoal, aren't going to be going straight down through that hole. So I want to take some kind of a stone, uh, and I've got a little stone right here, and I'm just going to place that right over the hole so uh, when the next layer that I put in uh, goes in, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not going to wash right out through that hole. And the next layer that I'm going to be putting in there is some sand. Now this is just river sand. I went down to a riverbank and collected this. Now obviously this sand is not clean. <laughs> you know, I mean it has all sorts of things in there. But as I'm flushing water through there, this is going to get better and better over time. Because this sand is relatively dirty, I decided I wanted to wash it off in the stream. I just put it down in some fast moving, relatively clean water and flushed it around to try to get as much sediment and leaves and debris out of it before I actually put it into my filter. The next step is, I've got this bucket right here of the, all this sand. I'm going to pour that right in. I'm not, I want to make sure that I don't dislodge my uh, stone in the bottom there. And I make a nice, nice bed of this sand right there. The next step is I want to take it and kind of uh, smooth it into kind of a concave shape. And the reason for that is that the next layer that I'm going to be putting into this uh, bucket uh, are uh, charcoal ashes from my fire. Uh, the charcoal is going to act as a kind of a chemical capture. Uh, if you ever looked at you know filters that you buy from the store, they always talk about having activated carbon in them. That's essentially charcoal that's treated with a chemical process to make more receptor sites for chemicals to bond to. Uh, I don't have that, but just having the ash from the fire is going to uh, you know go a long way to uh, you know capture a lot of the chemicals that are in there. Uh, when I say ash, what you're looking for is chunks of burned wood that's, uh, you know, charcoal all the way through. What you don't want is all the white stuff from the fire. The white stuff from the fire uh, is very caustic. Uh, you actually can use that to make soap. You, you mix that with water. There's some process that I don't know. Uh, you, and you mix that with a fat, and you can make soap with that kind of stuff. And it's, it, if you were running water through that, it would make your water very alkaline, uh, you know, maybe possibly dangerously alkaline. So you don't want to be getting any of that white stuff uh, from your fire. You just want the charcoals. And you can remove all that white stuff just by washing the charcoal, and that's what I've done here. So I've got a bunch of charcoal, and I'm going to pour that right on top of the sand and make myself a layer of charcoal right there. And then the next step is more sand. I'm going to put some more sand on there. All right. And I'm going to spread that around. I'm kind of pack it down a little bit. Again, I'm making kind of concave uh, forms at the bottom so that it'll sort of direct the water towards the center because you don't want the water circumventing going along down these edges. So I'm going to kind of wish that around like that. And then do some more charcoal. I like to just layer it. Oftentimes when you see uh, filters, they talk about just having like one charcoal layer. But, you know, if you have the ability to, why not have multiple layers of it? All right, so I've got that, and then I'm going to be adding some more sand on top of that. Now, once this is all done, it's important to kind of flush the system through, and you want to take as much clean water as you can, and by clean, I, I mean, you know, stuff that, you know, 
is as clean as you have available to you. And you want to really flush through the system. And as you're catching it, you're going to notice when the water uh, first starts coming out the bottom that it doesn't look clean. Uh, there's a lot of impurities. There's like little bits of silt and stuff that were mixed in with the sand. And that stuff is going to start getting flushed through the system. Once you start running it long enough, you're going to notice that the water gets cleaner and cleaner. And at that point, you know, uh, you're going to start getting water that's actually, you know, serviceable that you can actually use out of the system. But it does take a little time of flushing, you know, uh, as much clean water as you can through the system. And again, uh, this uh, device here, this is going to remove a lot of part uh, particulates from the water because the sand uh, layers are going to, uh, you know, catch things like little bits of leaves, algae, all that kinds of stuff is going to get trapped in that sand layer. The charcoal is going to be catching, uh, you know, any chemical impurities that might be in there as well as other physical impurities. I mean, let's face it, the charcoal, you know, is going to act as a physical barrier as well. Uh, and uh, once the stuff gets out of the bottom, you should be pretty good on both those fronts. But biologically speaking, bacteria could easily go through here. Even, uh, you know, uh, protozoa, things of that nature could make their way down through. So I'm going to take an extra step and I'm going to be boiling the water over the uh, uh, over the fire here to make sure that if I'm going to be uh, drinking it, consuming it in that way, that it's safe for me. But that said, if I'm uh, filtering water through here and I want to use it for uh, sanitary purposes, hygiene and all that kind of thing, uh, this is going to make that water that much cleaner. And if you don't feel like you have to boil it because it's just going to be used externally, then you don't have to worry with, uh, you know, mess with that step. So this is going to be a very useful asset for me. It's going to give me access to way more water than I was getting just by using a life straw. And there are other ways of building these as well. I'm using a bucket because I had uh, available to me. Other people uh, I've seen use cloth where you, uh, you know, have bags of cloth and they kind of layer over each other and one drips into the other. Like you'll have a, a, a cloth that's holding sand and then a cloth that's holding charcoal and another cloth that's holding sand. There's all different types of variants. In fact, I, I have seen some traffic cones and I was almost thinking, I wonder if I should grab one of those traffic cones and I could, you know, pack all this stuff into the traffic cone and it would, you know, direct all the water down. There are so many different variants on it, but the basic idea is you want to get this dirty water being pushed through sand, charcoal, sand again, and repeat that as often as you can to get it cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. When I'm sourcing my water for running through the filter, I like to try to grab it from the cleanest source that I have available. This pool here is pretty good because it's reasonably deep, so a lot of the particulates have already kind of settled out of the water. And while there's certainly going uh, to be biological contamination in here, and we definitely need filtering, we're starting out with a cleaner product, so all the better for our filtering process. As you can see here, the water... Whoa! The weather is really feeling nice today and it's got me feeling like I want to get going on my gardening project. This is the area that I've chosen. Uh, it's a nice field kind of in a valley. As you can see behind me there's access to water and that's really important because I'm not going to have a hose or a spigot or anything to water this stuff. I can't set up a sprinkler system. All the water that's going to fall on my crops is either stuff that falls from the sky down as rain or stuff that I grab from here in buckets and bring over to where I'm going to be planting the plants. So the proximity to water is really important. Also, it has good sun exposure. It's pretty wide open here. Uh, there is some short brush in the area, uh, and I'm going to be taking some of that down today. But there's a lot of really good sun here. South is the direction right here behind me. And, uh, you know, as the sun arcs through the sky, it's going to hit this area just behind you, uh, you know, really well with a lot of sun. The other nice thing about this area is that it's not it's not really very uh, conspicuous. Uh, the only way that someone's going to come in here and see the garden is if they literally just walk through the area. It's kind of enclosed by trees on all sides and even the area where I'm going to be putting the garden, it, I'm going to leave a lot of the high bushes uh, along the edge of it. So there's really only one way that people would be able to see that there's a garden planted here if they're coming through. Is it a risk? Yes, it's still a risk, but you know, given what I have available to me, which is a lot of forest land, you can't really do gardening in the forest unless you're going to be planting like wild edible trees or something like that. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the kinds of crops that you're going to grow close to the ground, you can't do it in the forest. You need a wide open area. And this place has sun, it has privacy, and it has water. So today I'm going to get going on preparing the earth. And I've got some actually like really pimped out tools to do it. <laughs> I've got an, a real shovel and I've got a real straight rake. Uh, these were 
you know, I'm not surprised that these kind of things were finds that I was able to get when I went into uh, that little, uh, you know, suburb kind of complex over there. Because when people were evacuating their homes or, you know, the homes were being raided, you know, there wasn't anyone saying, quick, honey, grab the shovel, <laughs> grab the straight rake, you know, before we evacuate. Uh, and even when people were doing, uh, you know, raids on the homes, uh, you know, people were looking for food. They were probably looking for money and, I don't know, big screen TVs and stuff like that. But stuff like this was completely overlooked and I was able to grab it and boy are these going to be really useful today. There were a lot of different options for places that I could have chosen to put the garden in. But uh, this one here I think was really the best for a com uh, combination of reasons. Uh, including really nice access to sun. Whoa, 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 look, look! Yeah, there was a lot of that last night too. A lot of shooting stars. And of course yesterday, that massive thing. You know, I, I gotta presume this is coming from the moon. Which means, uh, we're probably gonna see more of this. This area behind me is the area that I've chosen to plant the garden in, and there's a number of reasons for that. The first is, if you look behind me, to the left and to the right-hand side, there's a lot of high bushes. Uh, what that does is it makes it so there's really only one way that you can see into this area. So if there's anybody walking over there or walking back in that direction, they're not necessarily going to see that there's a garden here. And that's a good thing because I don't want people walking by and A, saying, hey, look, there's a bunch of tomatoes, why don't I take those? Or B, hey, there must be a person nearby, let's, you know, mess with them. So I want to keep this as secret as I can. The other reason that this area is pretty good is that it's nice and flat. Again, it has that nice solar exposure, uh, but also it's slightly elevated above uh, the areas that have the stream running through them. And that has two benefits I've noticed. One is that I don't want my crops to actually get flooded. Well, when you're in a floodplain, you tend to have good soils from the silts and, uh, you know, the seasonal flooding, you know, brings nutrients into the soil. So that tends to have a benefit for the dirt that's there, but you don't actually want your crops to be flooded while they're growing. Uh, the other benefit is that I've found that uh, the soil here, because of that uh, kind of, you know, seasonal flooding, is pretty good. I've, I've been pulling up all this, uh, this grass. I'm going to use the grass that I've been raking up as mulch, uh, you know, as I clear out the area. This is going to allow me to, you know, not have to water the stuff as much because I'm going to be mulching around all the crops. It'll also keep weeds from growing up as much because I'm, you know, shading the soil, so I'm going to have less problem with weeds coming up and shading my crops. Although a lot of those weeds that are, uh, you know, invariably going to grow are probably going to be edible, so we'll be seeing about those later because uh, in the past, whenever I've grown a garden, some of my best uh, crops were the wild edible weeds that invaded the garden. But anyway, I'll be using uh, the mulch to try to minimize how many weeds are going to be shading uh, the crops that I am growing. Uh, and again, because this is a uh, kind of a floodplain, and we're starting to get some of that nice sunlight that is going to really be beneficial to the crops here, uh, the soil is actually pretty darn good here. When I done my uh, initial recognizance of you know looking at the soil in this area, I thought I was going to have to bring stuff in because a lot of the soil that I was looking at was right near around where the water was. It tended to be sandy. It tended to be rocky. The soil up here is looking pretty good. So this is private. It's elevated slightly. And it's got some pretty good soil in here, so I think this was a really good choice. So this section of forest floor I think is going to be uh, useful for grabbing to kind of lighten up the clay soil that I have down in the valley over there. So uh, what I'm, I'm doing is I'm kind of trying to take off a lot of this top layer here. It's a lot of uh, pine needles, and uh, the pine needles are going to tend to acidify the soil. Now that would be fine for crops like tomatoes that like a, an acidic soil, and I may grab some of these. In fact, I'll put them in my little bucket right here. I may grab some of these for any place where I'm going to be planting tomatoes. But for a lot of crops, uh, they're going to acidify things beyond what you would really want. Uh, what I'm going to grab instead is this soil that's just underneath. And I don't want to go down too deep because it's kind of a, a thin layer of topsoil and you can really tell the difference because you, you know, once you get past the pine needles on the top, you get a really, really dark bed of, of soil right on the top and then it starts getting lighter as you go down. The, the darker stuff is the, uh, the nice, rich, organic material. And just point it right off the top here. Now I'm not going to need that much of it because again the soil down there is pretty good. It's a little high in clay content. but. I'm going to be using this just to kind of lighten it up and improve the, uh, the drainage of what's there. Some of this rotting stuff here, rotting log bits and things like that, that all goes in the bucket. That's all going to help as well. All right. 
So here's the soil that we got here. And it definitely has some pretty, well, it's got some ice content right here, but it's got some pretty good clay content. And the way you can kind of test for clay is you just take the, uh, the dirt. If you can make it into a really easy moldable ball in your hand, you know you get a fair bit of clay in there. So what I'm planning on doing is taking this, which is good soil because it's going to hold moisture. It's not going to have, it's not sand where the moisture is just going to run right through it. It's going to hold moisture, but I want to lighten it up. And what I'm going to be using to do uh, for that is some uh, soil that I grabbed from the forest. And this is, I'm going to get these pine needles out of here. This is kind of a light, organic, decomposing duff layer. And if I take this and kind of just stew it in with the clay, I'll be able to get kind of a, uh, a growing medium that kind of gives me the best of both worlds. I'll have the lightness of the, the soil uh, from the forest, and I'll have that moisture retaining uh, capacity of the clays here. So just kind of stewing those in with each other. It's dirty work, but it's going to pay off in the end with much higher quality soil than if I grew in straight forest soil or grew in this straight clay. It's been an awful lot of work here today, but I feel like I've got the soil ready to a point where it's, you know, it's okay to start putting seeds in it. Uh, I've got this trench here in front of me, and I'm going to do something a little bit special with this. Uh, Native Americans here in this area used to plant uh, three different crops together, which uh, are referred to as the three sisters. And those crops were uh, some type of squash or a pumpkin, uh, beans, like a legume, a vining bean, and corn. And what was great about these is that they offered a diversity of nutrition between the beans and the corn. You had a grain and you had a legume, so you could create a cre uh, complete protein when you uh, mix those together and ate them. Uh, and the pumpkins uh, offer a lot of uh, vitamins and uh, nutrition, and uh, they all work together kind of physically in the same area as well. Uh, you'd have the corn, which would grow nice and tall, and uh, that would give uh, structure for the beans to vine up the corn. Uh, and then you have the pumpkins uh, that, you know, they stay pretty low uh, down towards the ground, and the broad leaves of the pumpkins would offer some, kind of some shade to the soil, keep the soil from drying out. So those three things work together super, super well. So uh, it's with some degree of disappointment uh, that I only have two of the three sisters. It's not going to be a threesome, unfortunately, here. We just have two of them. I have beans and I have pumpkins. I actually had a package of corn, but it was all empty. Um, which was really disappointing, <laughs> but yeah, I've got what I've got. Um, so I've got uh, some of the beans right here in this container. And what I'm gonna be doing uh, is uh, putting in the beans just in kind of a trench that I make here with my hand. And I've kind of softened the soil up, so it's not a big deal to kind of put my hand through there. Uh, and I'm gonna just make kind of a, a rough run of beans right through the middle here. The next thing I'm going to be doing is I've got some pumpkin seeds and I'm going to be putting pumpkin seeds just uh, maybe every like foot and a half or so in the trench right along there. Okay, and now that I've got these guys in here, I can just take the soil and lightly cover up the seeds that I've got here. Um, at this point, uh, I, I should give it a good watering to kind of soak, it, uh, soak the, the soil to get the beans getting ready to germinate. Obviously, I'm missing the corn uh, part of this equation, so the beans aren't going to have anything to vine up, but I've got a solution to that. Uh, I've got this stick here, uh, which is, uh, some people will refer to this, at least in terms of the way that I'm about to use it, as a witch's comb. Um, the shorthand for anything related to nature that's called witches, like witch hazel or witch this or witch that, which uh, for practical purposes means probably useful. <laughs> so if you're ever looking at, you know, at different plants or things of that nature and, and something's called witch, it probably means that it's useful. Uh, that's, that's essentially what it translates into. And what's useful, useful about the witch's comb is uh, it gives the, uh, the beans that I just put in there something to vine up. So I'm going to put this here. I'm going to get a couple other ones for along here. And that way, when the beans start growing, they're going to grab onto this and they'll have something to go up. Obviously, if I had corn plants, I could, uh, you know, have them going up the corn plants. I don't. But, you know, honestly, even if I had corn in here, I'd probably put some of these in here just for some extra strength and uh, rigidity so that if there's wind, it's not kind of blowing things over. Um, 
I'm gonna pull this out right now though, and the reason is because this is really, this is really early in the spring. Uh, we're, I have every anticipation that there could be some night frost, and I don't want these seeds that I just put in here to get hit with frost and killed. So there's a bunch of different ways that I can deal with that. Uh, one of them, which uh, you, you know used to be popular with people, is to take like just an old juice container and cut off the bottom. Now, if I didn't have a million of these things, because people were always throwing these things out. If I didn't have a million of these, I would not want to be cutting off the bottom of these, because these are really useful items. But I've got a million of them, and I can afford to, you know, chop off the bottoms of some of these. Um, I'm not going to be using this right here. I'm going to be putting on some of my other plants that are uh, made in a row. But the idea with these is if you plant a plant right here, you can just put this right over the plant, maybe uh, put some dirt up around it so it's not going to go blowing away, and it acts like a little miniature greenhouse. In fact, one nice thing about uh, these bottles is that they go one step further in terms of acting like a greenhouse, uh, in that they have a, a, a roof vent that you can open by taking off the top. So if it's kind of cold, uh, cold outside, but you want to leave uh, the bottle over your germinating plant, you can take the top off so it doesn't overheat in there and you can kind of control that a little bit. I'm not going to use this here because I've got a whole row of plants. Uh, I'm going to use it over on one of my like uh, solitary plants, but uh, there are other approaches that I can use for a whole row. Um, before I jump over to what I'm actually going to do for this, I've mentioned I got this. This is a drawer from a refrigerator and uh, this thing you know, this would be pretty good. You could do some, uh, you know, if I had a bunch of these, I could do them in a row. But again, the same idea. It's like a little miniature greenhouse, and uh, that will allow me to, uh, you know, keep them a little bit more protected. Even if it's, again, cold out, but if it's sunny, it'll help to warm the ground. That's not what I'm going to be doing here, though, because I've got a whole row, and at the moment, none of these guys even really need to have any sun. Now, the sun's helping to warm the soil, and that's good, but at nighttime, you know, they, they don't need the sun and they're underground, so it doesn't really matter. What I'm going to be doing is I've got just some plastic sheeting. And what I can do is take this plastic sheeting, hold it down with a couple rocks like that. I've got some other bags and I'll just kind of go down along the row. And then on top of this stuff, I can just put some insulation over it. And this is really going to protect the ground. If we have any kind of a, you know, a frost come in, as long as it's not a hard freeze, this is really going to protect the ground of what's under it. In fact, I could probably reverse these. I could probably put the, this stuff underneath and then put the bag on the top side. It would certainly make it easier to find the rose later on. Although, it, I, you know, maybe I want them camouflaged, you know, given the circumstances. So there are all sorts of different approaches for, uh, you know, insulating all this stuff. Wow, all these worms and everything in here. This is really good soil. There are all sorts of different approaches, but the basic idea is you want to have some kind of like a coat, some kind of a uh, way of protecting the soil. So at night, when it gets kind of chilly, uh, you know, you're not getting your frost hit, hurting your plants. Once these guys start to germinate, I can still use this kind of bag, but what I need to do is kind of pop it up a little bit, again, using the stones on the side, and make kind of a tunnel going through the middle. And again, you know, I can still take this stuff, kind of put it along the edges, to try to make it so uh, wind's not blowing under there. Uh, but this is just going to be for the next several weeks, and uh, you know, it's it's a little bit across your fingers. You know, I've I've got plenty of seeds, so if some of these come up and they get killed, I can always try to grow some new ones. But you know, I don't want to have a lot of loss of crops because you know this is what I might be depending on for food. And uh, given my skills as a gardener, that's that's a little unsettling. It's been a couple of weeks since I started my garden and it's doing really, really well. I take some credit for that because I put in a lot of work to try to make the soil uh, be really welcoming to the seeds and I've been watering them. But most of the credit honestly has to go to the fact that it has been really, really sensationally hot lately. Um, I don't know what time of the year it is. I honestly don't know what the month is and I don't even know exactly what the temperature is. I never put a thermometer in my bug out bag. But it's been really hot. I've noticed it, and all the plants have definitely noticed it, both all these wild ones and the ones in the garden. So things along those lines have uh, been going really, really well. And it's been weird for me because, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was lighting fires to try to keep myself from freezing to death. And now, the only time I ever really have to light a fire is if I want to like make a little bit of smoke to keep the bugs down, because the bugs are starting to come out. And also is a, you know, a cooking fire for you know, cooking my food. Uh, today, I have an opportunity to do uh, a different way of lighting fires than I've been able to recently. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but up in the sky, 
there's been almost I think it's smoky I think that there's a lot of smoke and dust and debris up there and I think it might have something to do with all the asteroids coming in uh, it's almost been like kind of a silvery sheen up there but today it's kind of cleared out and because I now have access to the Sun I have access to a really great way of starting fires that honestly it's got to be one of my favorite of all the different methods that I'm aware of with the exception of lighting a match this has got to be the easiest way to start a fire and in fact it actually has some advantages over lighting a match and I'll share with you what those are as I do it all you need uh, are some old charcoals dry from your last fire I always make sure that I keep some of these and when I'm when I used to go camping I'd like travel around I'd uh, keep a little tin of embers just like this so that I could start a fire easily the next time these start really really easily uh, just got a little bit of tinder, got some dried pine needles and some little dried uh, pine branches. And here's the most important thing right here. And this is something I kept in my, my bug out bag. It's showing a little bit of its wear. It's got a kind of a break in there. But what this is, is just a Fresnel reading lens. Uh, people would, used to use this for like if you wanted to you know, read a book and enlarge the type, you could use one of these. And it can also be used to focus the light of the sun and start a fire really, really easily. What I'm going to do to begin is just take a couple of these pieces of uh, ember here and uh, select the site where I want to uh, start my fire. I think oh, that one's falling apart. Uh, I think this one is good here because this one has this little groove here. It'll allow air to kind of get in there. And it's really, really simple. All I do is focus it on my ember. Because the, uh, the charcoal is already, it's already black, absorbs that the heat really easily. It's already starting to pop right there. I like it when these pieces are bigger because uh, I don't risk burning my finger as much. So I'm just blowing across it and I can already hear that there's, there's red ember in there. So the next step is just take that other piece and put it up next to it and then blow. Making a little sandwich. Whoop, there we go, it's hot. Okay, once you got hot on both sides. Now I've got a little sandwich here with a little air passing between. Once you got two of these charcoals, both red hot, it's really easy to start the fire from there. Just gonna take them and place them in here so they stay against each other. And I just start adding other little pieces of charcoal around them and on top of them. Once I got a nice little red core in there, I can start adding some fuel. Right, so here's some pine needles.
So this method here clearly has a lot of advantages because this tool can be used so many times over and over again. This thing lasted in my pack for years and years. It's only recently that it got the little break in it. But even with the break, it continues to function. And it takes up so little room in the pack. I take it and put it inside of a little padded envelope in the back of my pack. Maybe if I had something rigid, that would have made it so it never even cracked. But again, even with the crack, it's super, super useful. You can use it over and over again. And as long as you have sunlight, it's a really easy way to start a fire, especially if you have some of those old charcoals from your last fire. But it doesn't work at night, it doesn't work on a cloudy day. So I'm gonna talk about another way that you can start a fire that's also pretty easy, especially if you have the right materials to start with. My second favorite fire starting technique that does not use matches is definitely a far distant second as compared to using the magnifying glass. Whenever I have the ability to use the sun's natural, free, easy to use energy to start a fire, I always go that way. But if it's cloudy, if it's nighttime, you need a different technique. And if you want to save on matches, using a flint and steel is a pretty decent way to go. Uh, the two benefits I see of the flint and steel are, you know, as compared to the sunlight, you can use it any time of the day. And as compared to matches, it's really tiny and super compact. The number of uh, fire starts that I can get out of this little flint and steel set, if I was gonna do that with matches, it would be boxes and boxes of matches. It would take up an awful lot of room. And if you're trying to put something into a bug out bag or a camping bag, a flint and steel takes up very little room and you can get a lot out of it. That said, there are certain requirements that you really have to be uh, attentive to if you're gonna start fires using a flint and steel. And the most important one is what you're starting with for your tinder and whether it's dry enough. And I cannot enough emphasize dry. It needs to be very, very dry for these sparks to actually ignite it. What I've collected is some uh, little bits of kind of hay and grasses and some leaves that were baking out in the sun in the field over here. They've been baking there all morning. It's not enough for like, you know, it's all dewy in the morning, the sun comes up, 10 minutes later things seem dry, you collect it up. You really want to have this stuff really dry, dry, dry if you want to have any kind of a positive experience using this. So what I'm gonna do with this material here is take it and kind of crunch it down into kind of like a powder. I wanna get the pieces, little fragments of it to be very, very fine. And the reason for that is because when the sparks come off of the flint and steel set, they don't have that much thermal mass to them. They're very hot, but they don't have a lot of thermal mass. So you really want to make sure that the little bits that you're gonna start burning also don't have a lot of thermal mass so that they are able to ignite. If you have a piece of tinder and it's connected to a larger piece and the larger piece can just kind of draw away all of that, uh, that heat from the ember that you have flying in there, uh, it's not gonna ignite. But if you can get really, really little bits, just little bits like powder, it's gonna work a lot better. Another thing that works really decent is pocket lint or any fluff, if you can find an old mouse nest, uh, you know, that, that'll work because they did a lot of the collecting for you. And usually mice nests are made in a place that is gonna be pretty, uh, pretty dry. All right, here we go. So a lot of the, the very fine stuff kind of feathered out down onto the bottom there. And I'm gonna try right here. The flint and steel set here I have is actually, I believe this is called a ferro rod set. Uh, but the essential idea is you have two pieces of metal, one scrapes across the other and uh, knocks off some super hot flex onto you know, your tinder pile. Before you do that, however, you wanna make sure you have something to put on there to keep the fire going. And I've got these, some little bits of hemlock uh, bough, some kind of a dry stick, very thin that you can put on because if, if and when you get this thing burning, you don't wanna lose your, your fire. All right, so what I do with this is I take uh, this rod here and just hold it in position and then quickly scrape across. There we go. And you just kind of keep doing this until one of them catches. Well, I got a little bit there. I almost got one burning there. Try again.
I'm having to be really gentle with this. Alright, so obviously I was able to get that going, but it was a lot more difficult than using the magnifying glass. And a lot more of it had to deal with, uh, you know, what was available. You know, if this stuff had been maybe a little bit more humid, I maybe couldn't have pulled this off. So while the flint and steel or ferro rod is a handy technique and it's nice to have when you don't have access to you know, bright sunlight, you know, uh, they all have their ups and they all have their downs and whatever technique you use, and I would suggest you have multiple techniques in your in your bag ready to go because you never know what the conditions are going to be. But whatever techniques you have in there, it's really important that you practice them because what I just did here was, you know, there was a fair bit of luck, there's a fair bit of experience, and there's a fair bit of almost... Um, you know, indescribable, I'm going to use the word artistry, not to pat myself on the back, but to illustrate uh, that there are all these little f subtle fundamental things that have a huge in, uh, impact on the outcome, the angle that I'm blowing the air through, exactly how much air is coming out of my mouth, you know, exactly uh, how much I ground the stuff down. These are all things that are really difficult to convey, uh, you know, just through, uh, you know, listening to someone describe a process. And it's really important to actually get out there, try it yourself, and get a real sense of how difficult it is. And it That was the biggest one yet. Yeah. I don't think it landed too far from here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that one out. Jeez, there's a ton of smoke up there. Uh. Now this is definitely becoming more of a definitely becoming more of a problem. I mean, one of these is going to land on me at some point. Let's see. Huh. Where is it? Oh, jeez. Oh, that's a lot of smoke. Oh, so much for clear skies for starting fires. Of course, at the moment, I suppose my challenge is going to be less starting fires and more about avoiding getting burned up in one. I ought to go check that out. That's gonna be that's gonna be burning this way. It was another hot night last night, and I'm starting to wonder if it's the Fourth of July yet because it sounded like it. I mean, there were just booms and pops. All night, things screeching through the sky. Uh, it seems like it's starting to intensify. In fact, I don't know, there's nothing going through right now, but I mean, you rarely have, you know, 10 minutes go by without hearing something uh, come from overhead. Uh, that kept me up for a while, but I, I don't know, I guess your body can only stay tense for so long. I ended up uh, falling asleep eventually. I think I slept pretty well. Uh, the sun was pretty high in the sky when I woke up this morning, so I guess I woke up kind of late <laughs> for what that's worth. Um, and uh, today uh, I'm, I'm planning on going and checking to see if uh, if the forest is on fire down over where that huge one landed. There's still kind of some smoke coming from over in that direction. Maybe we'll get some rain at some point. It's so hot and humid right now. It feels like, man, if we can get some rain coming through it, man, it'd be thunderstorms. But, um, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, it's still dry. So I want to check just to see if, you know, there's a forest fire burning my way and if I need to know about that. I don't want to just take like a leisurely stroll over there though. I want to make use of the time. So what I'm going to be doing as I go over is I want to do a lot of uh, wild edible plant collection. Uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, varied spaces between here and that direction. I've kind of explored off over there a little bit and uh, there's a lot of forest area and there are some open fields and open fields tend to be the place where you get the most wild edible stuff. Uh, underneath the forest canopy there's some stuff here in fact I'm hoping I'm going to be able to get some Indian cucumbers. Uh, I don't know if that's the PC term for them but you know in every book I've ever seen they're called Indian cucumbers uh, and it, it's a, a nice little plant because the the root underneath the ground is kind of sweet it has like a sweet cucumbery taste to it and that'd be kind of a nice treat. I've seen actually a couple of them around the camp here itself, and I'm hoping I can find like some patches 
you know, uh, when, I, when I head out and find some more of those because that would be a nice treat. So one way or the other, I'm going to come back with knowledge and I'm going to come back with food. So I think that will make good for a good day. Oh, here we go. This is one of my favorites right here. This is the Indian cucumber. And uh, these are a great little wild edible in the forest because they, they have kind of a sweetness to them. Uh, the way you can identify them uh, is the way that the, uh, the veins and the leaves, they all run parallel to each other. You can see there's a central vein and then a couple of little veins that run along the side of that vein and they're parallel. Now if you see one vein down the center and then little veins branching off of that, uh, that is a different type of plant, um, which I'm not familiar with and may or may not be edible, but it's not an Indian cucumber. Uh, and the way that we collect this is uh, we're not eating the leaves. What we're eating is down at the bottom of the stem right here. These tend to grow in uh, forest soils that are pretty uh, fluffy. Oftentimes in pine forests, I'll, I'll tend to find them a lot. And we're just going to follow the stem right down. And what we're looking for is a little white tuber. We, oh, it broke off, but it's still going to be down there. There's a little white tuber down here. There's the root right there. And somewhere along here, there's going to be a little bulge. Here it is. There we go. This little guy right here. Now, it's small. It's not like you're finding a huge potato in the ground. But what's great about these is, like I said, they've got kind of a sweetness to them. And I would, of course, wash this off before I eat it. But it, it tastes a little bit like a sweet cucumber. And it's a really nice treat, whereas a lot of wild edible plants, maybe they're a little bit bitter or they're sour, but, you know, sugar in nature is a little bit rare. That's why, as a life form, we tend to crave it. Um, and it's nice to be able to find a source of it in the tubers of these little plants. Several years ago, I was driving towards Devil's Tower in Wyoming. That's in the western United States. And I was heading there from the southwest. Uh, after about an hour of driving, I noticed that the sun was in the exact opposite position in the sky that it should have been in if I was heading in the right direction. As it turns out, I was heading towards something that my GPS claimed was Devil's Tower. I honestly don't know what it was, but it wasn't the actual Devil's Tower. I flipped around, pointed myself in the right direction, and ended up heading there. And uh, I bring that up because something similar just happened to me right now. Now, uh, yesterday, when that uh, meteor came in, it landed off in the east. Uh, that's where it crashed. That's where I saw the smoke. Uh, when I got up this morning, I, without really thinking, I just started heading towards the smoke, but I've been walking south all day, which makes me think, you know, whatever meteor landed over there, uh, I guess it stopped burning. It's not burning anymore, and maybe there was another one last night, but there are a lot. There's apparently a lot coming down, and uh, you know, I suppose I should check this out anyway, and I'm, you know, I'm picking up lots of food as I go. So, I mean, it's not like a waste of time or anything, but uh, apparently there are a lot of meteors coming down, and they are starting more than one fire. And that's got me feeling a little bit on edge. One of the great things about wild plant identification, I think, is that you don't have to know everything before you can get started. I think a lot of people uh, felt that they couldn't really even get going with wild plant foraging because if they didn't know everything, then they wouldn't know anything at all. And that's really not the case. You can start off knowing just a few of the easy plants to identify, and then from there, you can kind of branch out and learn more things. And that's a totally okay way to do it. What I'm looking at right here is a plant that I don't know what it is. Um, I'm not sure what this is, but I'm uh, focusing on it now at the moment because this is the plant that I was referring to earlier with the uh, Indian cucumber, and this is the one that is not Indian cucumber. See how it has a central vein down the middle, and then there's branching veins coming off from that one? This one is not Indian cucumber, and I don't need to know exactly what it is. All I need to know is that it's not the plant that I'm looking for. And there are so many different plants that are like that, where you can start with plants that are easy to identify, start with those, and then kind of branch out. And you don't have to know the entire world of botany in order to start, because there are some plants that are pretty darn easy to identify. I think Indian cucumbers are one of those. Dandelions, I think for a lot of people, dandelion is an edible plant, and plenty of people can identify those. You can start with just a few, and then you can kind of branch out from there. And this right here, these are Indian cucumbers, and I'm noticing that this one here is getting up towards the fruiting stage. Uh, once uh, Indian cucumbers get a little bit larger, they'll send up this secondary little parasol there. And uh, if I go down to the bottom of this, I should be treated with an extra large 
tuber. Whenever I do gather wild edibles, uh, I, I, I like to leave some of them in the ground so that they can spread for next year. And, and that is something, even during an emergency situation, I think is a good idea. Unless you're absolutely desperate and you're starving to death, it's always a good idea to leave more for later. So I'm not going to clear all of these. But I am going to take this extra big tuber right here. And you can see it was starting to, uh, starting to grow another one right there. But that's an extra large tuber, and that'll be just as sweet as the small ones. One of the great places for looking for wild edible plants is the periphery between the land and the water. I've been walking along this little stream and I found a few things, but in particular, I'm excited about that. To me, that looks like wild blueberries. But the thing is, I'm not 100% certain that these are blueberries. I see behind them that there are some raspberry branches here. And there are raspberries on there. And one nice thing about raspberries, I know, is that anything in North America that looks ostensibly like a raspberry, maybe isn't a raspberry, but it's at least edible. It's not something toxic. I don't know if that's true of blueberries, but I've got something that is going to allow me to figure that out, which is a really, really important asset in anybody's bug out bag. And that important item to me is a wild plant identification book. I've always kept mine in a plastic bag in my bug out bag, so if it ever got damp or humid, the book itself wouldn't be destroyed. A book like this is super valuable. This one here has all sorts of edible wild plants in North America. There are different guides for different regions, but I've always kept this with me because while it's possible, that, you know, at home to kind of flip through the book and try to learn from it, it's much easier and much more intimate. And I think you get a lot more out of it when you have the book and you're out in nature and you have the plants right in front of you. So you can kind of, uh, you know, reference the plant directly into the book and have any questions that you have answered back and forth. And I find that you learn a lot more that way. Uh, also, it's really hard to keep this much knowledge in your head. So when you're out in the field, it's nice to be able to refer to it. Now, I'll uh, give you a, kind of a story of something that happened to me that illustrates that point. Many years ago, I was working uh, in a, a part of the country that I you know, didn't live in, and there were different wild edible plants there. Between my jobs, I was going out, taking hikes in the woods, and one day, I found wild edible onions. Those didn't grow really so much in my area, but I found them in this area, and I was excited. So I was gathering wild edible plants, including these onions, and I brought them back, uh, and I made a salad for myself. I had some salad dressing. I threw it all together. I was very excited about it. And I started eating it, and then I started thinking to myself, you know what? Wild onions have something, some features in common with a plant called camas. In particular, death camas. Uh, so you can imagine where my mind went instantly. Now, one moral of this story is you should check things thoroughly before you put them into your body. I'd already eaten the stuff, and while I was chewing on it, it kind of went through my head. You know, did I just eat, eat death camas? It was nice to have this book because I was able to instantly go in and find out whether I needed to drive myself to the emergency ward or if it was actually wild onion. As it turned out, it was wild onion. I was able to identify it by the smell, uh, but it was nice to be able to refer back to it. I think it's a great idea to carry a book like this around with you because while some things are really easy and really obvious and you can learn a bunch right away, there's all sorts of things you might encounter in, encounter in your environment, and it's great to be able to learn on the fly and have something that you can refer to. Right now, at this moment, I'm looking right over here at one of my favorite wild edible plants because it's so easy to identify, and it's right over here across the stream. It's really easy to identify from afar because all the plants in this family have very similar features, and this family of plants is referred to as the mint family. You can see it right here. Uh, plants in this family obviously are mint, oregano, basil. There are a lot of different plants in this family. And what's great about them is they all share a couple common features. One of them is if you look at the plant from above, you can see that there's kind of an alternating pattern of 90 degree angles between the leaves. Uh, one set of leaves, if you look at it from the side, 
are going in this direction here, and then the next set up are perpendicular to that at 90 degrees. Then you go up to the next set, and they're perpendicular to the set below, the same angle as the, the set below that, and they just kind of alternate as it goes up the plant. The other identifying feature of mint family plants is the stem. And the stems of mint family plants are not circular, they're not round, they're squarish shaped. They've got angles on them, and if you roll them in your fingers, you can very easily feel these squarish corners on them. And between those two traits, it's very easy to identify a mint family plant. Now, like I said, not every plant in the mint family is mint, uh, and not every plant in the mint family even tastes particularly good. But one nice thing about mint family plants is that none of them are poisonous. So at the very least, you're not gonna be poisoning yourself if you try nibbling on a plant from the mint family. One aspect to wild plant identification that's really quite apart from any question of wilderness survival is what it adds to your experience of being out in nature when you are out in the woods or out in the fields or, or walking around through any kind of a natural environment. I know that for myself, once I started learning a lot of wild edible plants, it really enhanced my experience of being out in nature. Whereas before, and for many people, being out in nature is sort of like walking through uh, uh, an environment that's almost like a stranger. It's, the, it's sort of like just background wallpaper. Once you start being able to identify a lot of uh, plants that you find as you walk along, instead of the environment around you feeling like a stranger, it really starts feeling like you're being surrounded by a lot of close friends. In this case, right here, I see a bunch of jewelweed. Now, jewelweed is somewhat edible. It's not the kind of thing you'd want to eat a lot of. It's more of a medicinal plant. And one of the benefits uh, that I've really found, always found throughout time of jewelweed is that if you take the leaves and the stalks, and I will just pull this one up right here, they have kind of like a, a squishy, uh, juicy kind of stalk. If you take the juice out of there, mash it around, kind of mix it in with the leaves to make kind of a, uh, a pulp, uh, it is a really helpful and I find effective uh, remedy for things like mosquito bites. If you have an itchy mosquito bite and you rub this kind of stuff up, make a little green pulp and smear it on the area that's uh, affected by the mosquito bite, I find that it is a, it, it really goes a long way to kind of soothing out uh, the, uh, the discomfort uh, from those. Even if it's only psychosomatic, <laughs> it seems to work. Uh, and there are other things right in this immediate area. And there are probably a lot of plants that I'm just floating over that are edible that I'm just not familiar with yet. But one that I am familiar with right here are nettles. Uh, and nettles are a really great food asset. Uh, nettles come in a couple different varieties. Uh, and one of them is known as the stinging nettle. And I don't know whether this is stinging nettle or not. You can identify nettles uh, with this kind of basic leaf shape kind of the way that the leaves grow around the stalk. And in particular, on this one, you can see these kinds of uh, pre-flower bud areas starting to develop. On the bottom, I'm seeing kind of these prickly little spines, which to me suggests maybe this is stinging nettle. But the nice thing even about stinging nettle is that it is still edible. If you take these leaves, and I am gonna take a bunch of these leaves, and you uh, are able to gather them and boil them. Once you boil them, it breaks down the acid that is in the needles and even wilts the needles into nothing. And it's a really, really nice uh, kind of bulk green food item, kind of like uh, cooking up a bunch of spinach. So this is a really nice crop of this stuff. Again, I'm going to make sure I don't take all of it. I'll, you know, take some portion of it. Uh, but nettles of all types are a, uh, a really delicious add to a meal. I'm getting up to the source of the smoke here and it looks like uh, there's kind of a clearing and I should be able to get a sense of how it's burning. I'm hoping that I'm going to get in there and see that it's, you know, putting itself out instead of getting bigger, but I guess we'll see about that. Uh, the day's gone pretty well. Uh, I've got a, a lot of leaves in the pack and, uh, and that's what I got is uh, a lot of leaves. Um, you know, that's, that tends to be what you get when you do wild edible foraging is there's a lot of leaves in there. Uh, and it's really reinforcing in me 
that I, I really got to get going with uh, the garden and you know I, I should I should do some more rounds uh, at some of the houses and see if I can find some potatoes I think potatoes would be great you know there's some calories in there uh, and, and you know beyond that you know start getting more serious about trapping and hunting even you know there's only so long that you can survive uh, you know scraping off of the remains of civilization I really got to get something going here that's kind of self-sustaining and uh, I don't have that yet but um anyway I, I mean yeah I'm happy I got a lot of leaves today but uh I'm gonna need more than that long term all right here we go it's definitely burning a lot there's a lot of smoke here and holy That's not an asteroid. That's not an asteroid. Some of those little ones here. I don't feel like this is a safe place to be. I was not expecting to find that. Shit. There's gonna be more coming. I mean, something like that happens, and I mean, there's gonna be other ones coming on the, on the way. Shit. Oh, Jesus. I can hear it, I can't see it. over there. embarrassed to admit that I made a pretty basic mistake when it comes to being out in a wilderness environment and that was not really paying attention. Uh, I was so fixated on what was happening up there in the sky that I kind of forgot to think about what was happening down here on the ground and as a result I don't want to say that I'm lost but this area that I'm in right now I don't know where the hell this area is. Uh, some people might call that lost, but there are techniques that you can use if you're in a wilderness environment to help get you from a place that you don't know where the hell it is to a place that you do know where the hell it is. Uh, and that is having a general sense of you know, what is around you in that area. Uh, in the area that I know that I've been kind of tramping around in here, I know that there are mountains off to the east. I know that there is a river that uh, goes from uh, the east to the west uh, that is south of here. So if I just keep walking south, I, I would hit that river. And I know that if I just kept going to the west, I would hit uh, a road. There's a road that runs north-south. So if I just kept going west, I would eventually hit that road. I also know that my camp is, I think it is probably west of where I am right now. But I'm not gonna, I'm not heading west. What I'm doing right now is I'm heading south, which might seem a little counterintuitive because if I know that my camp is off in that direction, why am I heading in this direction? Uh, the reason is because I wanna make sure that I actually get back to my camp. If I just start heading west and I don't really know where I am, I don't know if I'm gonna maybe go too far north of where my camp is, if I'm, maybe I'm, I'm far to the south and I would go too far south of where my camp is and maybe I'll hit that road eventually, but once I get to the road, I, I wouldn't know which way to turn. I won't know if I'm north of my camp on the road or if I'm south of the camp on my road. So what I'm doing is I'm using some techniques uh, to move through the wilderness to kind of lock in on where I uh, am headed. Uh, and uh, the technique that I'm using right now is called looking for a baseline. And the baseline that I'm using is that river that I mentioned. Now I know that if I walk to the river, and then take a right and start heading west, when I get to the road, I know that I'm gonna be south of my camp. So 
what I will be doing is instead of looking directly from my camp, I'm going to look for the river, take a right, and then uh, from there I will be heading west, and once I get to the road, I will know which direction to turn once I get to that road. If I just went directly to the road, you know, I'd get, to, I'd get there and I, I really wouldn't know. I mean, I, I could turn north, and you know, thinking that, you know, my camp is a little north of there, and I could just walk and walk and walk and never hit it. I could, you know, do the same thing, go south, make a mistake that way. So I'm using these techniques. Uh, like I said, it's called a baseline. When you're uh, searching for something, that you, you, you know that you can't miss, you know that you're going to hit it. And once I get to that baseline, which is the river, uh, which eventually I'm going to hit if I keep going south, once I get to that baseline, I'm going to use that baseline as what's called a handrail. And that means that if I, as long as I keep the river to my left and I just keep heading west, I know that I'm going to eventually get to that intersection between the river and the road. So it's not necessarily the fastest way to get where I want to get going, but it is a pretty effective way of making sure that I don't totally scroll. Oh, check this out. Do you see it? I had no idea this was here. It looks like, I don't know, I, I don't see a lot of foot traffic. I don't, I think this is just some old like, you know, based on the fact that it's just out in the woods, maybe it's like, like a, like a, a maple sugaring shack or something like that. I see a padlock on the, on the door. There. Well, there's something over the door. What is that? You know what? This place looks a hell of a lot better than my little shanty log and stick shelter. I don't think people use this. I mean, I'm looking at the ground. Around it, there was uh, this broken glass all over the ground. I think if people were using this, this would be more cleaned up. What is that? That looks new. It's got a piece of paper in it. There's a, uh, there's a little SD card in there. It's like a little computer chip card and it's got a date on it. It says April, April 7th. What the hell is it? Oh shit! Oh, 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 oh fuck. Uh, okay. It's, uh, ow. Uh, 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 that's a screw, a rusty screw. It went through, I felt that. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I got, um, well, that's why we bring the med kit. Uh, uh, what is this? It says April, April 7th. Uh, I wonder if it's got video on it. Uh, well, while I pump this full of Neosporin, I guess it's just one way to find out. I'm gonna need this camera. So what we're doing is we're communicating by a SIM card and people are traveling, mostly they're traveling, to be honest, south because it's warmer. But people are coming up as, to see what we're up to as well. And I had a bunch of these in metal containers along with radios and other stuff and solar flashlights. So we're actually recording stuff on camera like this and we're sending it off. And I'd encourage you to do this. I've had a couple of these I found uh, from a guy down south called Praxis, uh, who seems to be struggling a bit, but at least he's trying. And this is what we need to do. We're not winning, guys and girls. We're losing. We've lost our planet. We're not in charge of this planet, as I'm sure you know. But it's worse than that. 
this keeps going, there's going to be no education, no healthcare, no growth, no future. We're just going to scurry around living like rats in holes. And then what are we going to do? Wait for these dudes or dudettes to leave? We don't even know what they look like. We don't even know if they're robotics, aliens, one alien, a bunch of species. We don't even know why they're here. We have to find out why they're here. Until we find that out, it's hopeless. We have to get together. We have to figure it out. What I do know is trying to fight them right now with the technology that we have is a death sentence. So I'm still hiding, but I'm trying to find out stuff. There's been a lot of activity in this area right since the beginning. There's definitely something going on about 50 to 70 kilometers north of me, near Algonquin Park. I'm going to head up there and I'm going to try and know what's going on. There's been a few people in the area. Uh, we bump into each other and we talk regular. We've tried to go up there and find out and none of them have come back. So I'm going to have to be very, very cautious, but I, we've got to start fighting. If we don't fight, we've lost the earth for good. So I've just come back from a bit of break and entry, found some good stuff. We'll show you that in a minute. But there's a lot of the flitters flying around this morning, and I'm not really that comfortable. Don't want to get zapped. So about an hour from home, so there's a conduit pipe that I actually will bunk in. So what I do is I get five or six of these bags fill them full of leaves and sleep on two or three of these and have a couple of them on the sides and on my head and it's pretty toasty and I do reuse these at the moment supplies are pretty good these are always useful I find whether it's just me that the flit is if I'm lying flat on the ground with one of these over me, shiny side down, they don't see me. The important thing is your head and your body. Whether they're picking up heat or not, we don't know. What we find up in Canada is the uh, radios. If you use any sort of radio or any sort of uh, active device, like for night vision or anything active, they are targeting it and zoning and killing any movement in the area. So if you are going to use stuff like that, be careful. I always carry plenty of extra bags with me, because you never know what you're going to find. This is stuff I also always carry with me. You might be fascinated by this. This is actually an old compass. Got a bit of magnifying glass on it. Uh, almost points to true north and it has a mirror on that side for signaling but I use it to see how rough I'm looking useful things these old things this is quite reliable I haven't had any problems with it the modern ones I find they don't take too much abuse speaking of which I also use these small compact and they do the job what I really like about these is the fact that they are made out of metal and ceramics nice little thing like I say I always carry a lot of these so we have made a decent insulation preferably with two garbage bags full of leaf debris that I'm lying on completely not just my trunk but a hole of me and then use a sleeping bag and if it's really cold I'll put one of the garbage bags with leaves on top of me as well it does work this is more your summer camper but it works for this you can be cold for a night so I don't know even what the date is anymore. Everything got very confused up here after the arrival and then the event. What I do know is that Kitty and Wolfie and her parents and the cats headed off to the Shire and there wasn't enough room in the car for me so Kitty was going to come back and she never came back. I gave it about a week and I headed on my bike out to find her. So just outside of Peterborough I found the car. They'd been killed along with a lot of people that day um, and that week. They were in a car, they were using technology. The flood has found them and killed them. I buried them as best as I could. I consider continuing onwards to the Shire, uh, which is where my most of my bug out stuff is and where I expected to go. But I just couldn't. I turned around and went back home. So I'm still in the new market area and I've been here ever since. Pretty rough early on. Uh, I drank a lot and it was pretty tough, but I had a ton of food in the house and I'd stored up a lot of water so I was okay, even when the power stayed off, I was fine, even through the winter with the fireplace and the other stuff I have. 
So after the first disasters and terrible things and all the rest of it, what was left of the police and the army in Canada actually got the people that were surviving together and encouraged them to bike and cycle westwards. So as far as I know, most of the surviving population in Toronto actually tried to head towards BC. I wish them well. There's no way I was going to do that anyway <laughs> because of the winter. And the winter came in really quick. It came in very, very fast and it was brutal. To try and get to BC on foot from Toronto, uh, good luck. I know a lot of people try to go south. Uh, a lot of people went to the cottages. A few of them survived because they had supplies and their people were in contact with. There's a bunch of preppers up on 48 that I've been in contact with. A couple of people in the area. So what I do is at night I go around and I use my trusty crowbar and I'm careful. I break into abandoned houses and you'd be shocked what you find. And what I'm doing is I'm storing most of this stuff up, not because I need it, but to try and get a nucleus of supply together for a resistance group. We have to fight these people. They killed Kitty. They killed a lot of people. So, coriander, oregano, not a lot of it. But something's better than nothing. Some tea. Chocolate. That was always Kitty's favourite. Cough mixture, a bit of coconut left over, a few cold tablets, some seeds, can't plant yet but I'm going to, sewing kit, this is what I got out of two houses, I mean people have ransacked the stuff and everybody ran out of food but you'd be shocked what's actually hidden away, a tin of beans, expired 2019, perfectly good. This is brilliant. That's a score. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing. I'm going to head to the pipe now and make the bed, sit in. A bit worried, there's been a lot of flitter activity and we'll see what we see. That's it from me, Hoople's Cat in Canada. Five, four, six months after the arrival. If you can, use SIM cards, make video messages, say what you know to be true in your area about what's going on. We need data points. We need to know what these things are and why they're here. We have to beat them, we have to fight them. I do think it's going to be the extinction of civilized humanity, if not the species. Toodles. hardest decisions for preppers or really for anyone to make before or after all this went down uh, was being forced to choose between what you know and what you don't know. Uh, for preppers it was always uh, the decision between bugging in or bugging out. Bugging in means you go back to your house, you know, you got all your stuff there, you try to make your stand from you know what you know and what's familiar. Bugging out was going to some other place, you know, out into the wilderness, out to some other place, you try to bring what you can, uh, but you're leaving what's familiar. For me, when all this went down, the choice was obvious. I went back to my house, I bugged in, I had all my stuff there, and things went pretty well until I was forced to leave, you know, by, you know, circumstances. Uh, leaving was never what I would have liked to happen, but it's like kind of what I was forced to do. So I never really had a choice. Right now, I do have a choice. Uh, this place, for better or worse, has become my home for the past couple of months. It's not much. I mean, uh, I've got a water filter. I've got like, kind of a shelter here. And I, I do like my fireplace set up. That's all right. But, um, you know, it's not much, but it's familiar and I know it. And now I have a choice between this or the unknown. Bugging out to that sugar shack thing that I passed the other day. Uh, I'm not going to dance around it. I'm leaving. That place has everything, uh, you know, better than this place. I, I mean, it has a roof. Just, just the fact that it has a roof is, uh, you know, that, that's decision enough right there. Um, but still, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. I know this place. I've been here, and it's familiar to me. And going there, it is kind of jumping out into the unknown. Uh, for one thing, I know that people go there. And uh, 
you know, that's a bit of a wild card. Now, after watching that, uh, the video that was on the SD card in the bottle there, you know, I, I feel kind of actually positive about that. The people that were on there, um, I, I think the kind of people you want to cross paths with now. It's like, you know, it wasn't, I didn't watch the video. It wasn't like, a, um, you know, a preparing man or like, you know, some kind of like cannibal, uh, you know, recipe book or anything like that. It's like, it, it's the kind of people that you want to cross paths with. But, you know, you don't know what other kind of people go by there. And, and there are still some, plenty of people that are dangerous out here. In fact, on the way back yesterday, uh, I turned on the radio. I haven't actually had it on in a while. Just, I guess I was getting people sick, you know, after seeing, you know, the little video. And uh, I was able to make contact with someone and they seemed like they were a decent person. Uh, but what they described to me is that a lot of people out there aren't. All right, 10 4, move up two clicks, call back at 30. 10 4. Hey, I just picked up your transmission. This is Praxis Prep out of New England. Where are you located? Yeah, roger that, Praxis. We read your loud and clear 5x5. Five five. This is Survival Living. We're down here in Florida. Over. Wow, you're a ways off from here. I'm glad we were able to connect. Yeah, 10 4. I'm not sure how we are actually getting our transmission through. Every time we get a new repeater up, those damn ships just take it down. We put three new repeaters up last week, and usually after transmission, we got three minutes to clear an area before they come rolling in over. Yeah, I've seen plenty of that stuff my way, too. How are you guys holding up? Roger that, Praxis. Yeah, we've got a lot of problems out here. Uh, when all the power went out, I don't know, we've been going on for over four months now. We've got a lot of people that are displaced out here in the woods. Too many people decided that they're going to run to the woods and forage. They figured it'd be safer for themselves. It's not, man. We got people murdering each other out here. I mean, we're actually running a team right now, a reconnaissance and recovery team, and we're picking up bodies. We have uh, water pollution really bad here. Most of our water here in our locations come in from natural springs. Our reservoirs are contaminated. Now, I'm not sure if it's from the moon because we do have meteor fragments coming from the moon. I don't know if that's poisoning our water supply out here or if it's just our bodies. We are seeing people in the water. We are finding camps where people are chopping up people. I mean, we've even got cannibalism down here. Yeah, just the other day we were running a team and we come across a camp. Um, this guy had chopped up people. It's bad, it really was. Uh, he identified himself as a YouTuber. Yeah, it was freaking crazy, man. Uh, this is one of those guys that had plenty of bullets, but no supplies, you know, screaming, I'm just going to mow them down, yada, yada. So he was preying on everybody. Yeah, we, we had to swack him. I mean, that was it. I mean, we don't have no time for cannibalism out here. we got enough problems with having to worry about other people stealing and killing from others out here. So that is our biggest part. I mean, we are always out here on patrol. But like I said, after this transmission, we got three minutes and we got to haul ass. Yeah, Praxis, one of our largest problems besides people killing off each other and eating them is drinkable water. Who would have ever figured Florida needed water? The fact is, we're having a contamination problem. I mean, we are trying everything we can, everywhere from tarp collection of water to condensation bags to digging our own hand wells, everything. All of our natural springs, all of our reserves, our reservoirs, they're contaminated. So, like I said, we are doing everything we can. Water is essential out here, and we are doing everything possible and it's just not enough it's one of the reasons why we're out here trying to figure out what our pollution problem is i'm hoping we just got a viral outbreak but we have no team of medical doctors or scientists out here to even check this stuff but we have been pulling out a lot of bodies out of the water watch your six out there out all right guys let's go so that's what i'm concerned about at the moment it's just you know i've familiar with this place and I'm, I'm concerned about the fact that, you know, moving over there, I might start crossing paths with the kind of people that, you know, kicked me out of my last, my last place. So, um, yeah, I'm concerned about it, but I think on balance it's definitely worth doing. So, so that's the plan. I think it's going to be two trips that I'm going to be moving stuff over. There's not much. I mean, I've got my bedding stuff. I've got my food. I think the heaviest thing I have is this water filter right here, but I'm, I'm not going to take the sand with it. I'll just, I'll get new sand when I go over there. Uh, so I'll be dumping that out and I'll just take the bucket with me. Uh, the only real negative thing uh, that I, I can think of really is, uh, you know, my, my garden that I, I have. It's, it's proximal to here and it's, it's not going to be proximal to the other place. Um, 
So I, 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 I don't know. Um, it's worth it though. I mean, I'll, I'll make the trip. I, it's not, I haven't really checked on it in a while anyway, so it's not like I'm there every day. Anyhow, because it's, it's been mostly, you know, kind of cloudy and rainy. As a matter of fact, I, I'm starting to be concerned about charging the batteries on this camera and the, you know, the, uh, the radios and everything, because we just, we're not having a lot of sun. Right now, the sun came out this morning, but generally speaking, it's just cloudy, dark skies, and um, to be honest, it's starting to feel cold again. Uh, you know, I, you know, spring here in New England, it can get warm and then you get cold again, but, uh, you know, if the skies just keep getting darker and darker, you know, it's not going to be much of a summer. But in any event, uh, it's all the more reason to get over to a place that's more secure, more sheltered, and altogether a better situation. In light of the fact that I did get a little bit lost in the woods yesterday, I wanted to make sure that if I decided to return back to that sugar shack, I wouldn't have the same problem on the way back. And it should be pretty easy because of the geographical features that I used to get myself home yesterday. The way I'm going to start out is I'm going to head in a southeasterly direction and eventually I'm going to bang into that river that I used as a handrail yesterday to come back. This time I'm going to be heading uh, to the east instead of to the west like I did yesterday and I'm going to keep heading east on that river until I hit the point where I had hit the river initially. And the way that I'm going to be doing that, uh, aside from just my visual memory of the area, is I left myself a very clear mark. I found a bright piece of uh, fallen log, it's a white birch. I put it right next to the river uh, and the intent was that if I wanted to find my way back I could just walk to that point, find that white birch and then at that point I know that I take a left there and start heading north. At that point I am kind of heading up into open forest. I will have the mountains on my right to the east and I will have the road distantly uh, to my left off over in the west, but I am heading up into forest. So what I decided to do is I, I paid attention yesterday to my watch and what I did, wanted to do was get some kind of a general sense of how long it took me to walk from the sugar shack down to the stream. If I find myself today walking farther than that, it will give me a sense that you know you might have missed it and you may want to do a return back. I hope that that doesn't happen and I don't plan for that to happen because I was paying attention to other landmarks on my way. But it's nice to have that sort of temporal backstop where I, instead of banging into something like a road or a river and knowing that you've gone too far, this gives me a sense that I might have gone too far because I've taken too long to walk there and I might need to reset and give it another try. I didn't want to make the same mistake I made the other day and step on another screw, so I was kind of sweeping my feet across the ground as I got up to here. I didn't find anything, but uh, you know, definitely got to check this area if I'm going to be walking around to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, I got a padlock on here. Now there's there's plenty of just big stones around I could grab and just bang off this this whole hasp right here. But uh, I do have a lock picking kit, so I might as well uh, try to get in here with doing the least amount of damage that I possibly can. I've got time anyway, and um, you know, no reason to destroy stuff if I don't need to. The goal when you are trying to pick a lock is that you have a wrench that puts tension on the lock, giving it a little bit of a twist, and then you have a rake that is going in and it is just raking across all the pins on the inside. All the pins are in two pieces. Uh, they're like a shaft and they have a break point. And what you're trying to do is gently rake across the pins while you're putting some tension uh, on the lock in the direction of the turn. And uh, what, the, what you're doing is as you are gently raking across the pins, once you get one of those break points in the pin to line up with the break point in the barrel where the barrel rotates, uh, you'll feel just a little bit of a twist in the lock. And what that means is that that pin has been lined up in the right place so that it, that is ready to spin. Uh, locks have multiple pins, so you kind of just keep raking across it, and one by one you feel these little clicks in there. And it's, it's a lot of finesse, it's a lot of art, it's a lot of practice that takes uh, getting good at it. I'm not particularly good at it. Uh, I've been able to be successful on a couple of occasions, but it's tricky. Uh, you don't want to put too much tension in terms of the twist. You don't want to push too hard in terms of raking across the, uh, uh, across the pins, because you're pushing them into far, then they're going to bind up on the other side. It's, it takes a lot of practice. Uh, so it's not the kind of thing where you just kind of pull it out and 10 seconds later you're done. It's not one of those things where you buy a lock picking kit and suddenly, you know, you can pick locks. Uh, most of what's involved here is, uh, you know, 
the skill and the uh, the practice and the trial and error. And it is, you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> This never failed. It is gray and cloudy again out today, but this morning I have, honest to God, got rainbows shooting out of every orifice in my body, just to give you a beautiful visual right there. I am so, so pleased that I came here. This place is an absolute palace. Uh, from the outside, you'd never know it. From the inside, you'd never know it either. But, you know, compared to where I was, primitive backwoods camping, this place is wonderful. As you can see, there is a wood stove, an actual wood stove here. Um, uh, last night was just so wonderful. You know, if you, before the whole, you know, this whole situation came down, you know, if you had found someone living in a shack like this, you'd be like, oh, you poor dear, let's, let's get you out of there. This is atrocious. But, you know, uh, yeah, it, it reminds me of studies that were done, uh, you know, uh, you know, prior to all this about, like, happiness, you know, people's individual happiness and, and how much of it seemed, uh, you know, at least for people that were trying, didn't break out of this mindset, but like uh, how much of happiness was really based upon kind of like comparing yourself to other situations? Uh, you know, it, people who might maybe grew up in not that great situations. Uh, you know, if they, you know, started doing better and they, they had more disposable income in life, you know, they would have a great deal of happiness where someone else that had that same level of income, uh, you know, but maybe it always been there or, you know, just to have more income you know, their happiness would be lower. So, like, happiness is such a comparative thing. That's why, so frequently, people who engaged in volunteer work uh, would tend to be more happy, uh, you know, in terms of their life satisfaction because, you know, they can kind of compare their lives to the lives of people that aren't that fortunate. And, you know, that gives the people that are doing the volunteering, you know, that sense of, you know, you know happiness that, you know, you know they, they can kind of see the comparison and, um, you know, appreciate what they have. And boy, was I appreciating what I had last night. You know, again, just a, a, a dirt floor, you know, dirt, and there's uh, some concrete in here. You know, the, 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 the slats and the walls, there's still air that comes through, but so much better, so much better than what I've been doing the past, the past few months. Uh, you know, even down to some, a simple thing like this. Here is one of the things I appreciated most about last night, is for the past several months, ever since I acquired this wonderful device, which I honestly don't even know how to operate. I just, you know, I kept it, and I've, I've kept it in, you know, my other shelter there. But, you know, every night there was no room in there. I always had this thing kind of like poking up against me, and it's just so much space in here. It is like a palace in here. And it's, um, <laughs> it's just wonderful. So, um, yeah, there are six of these in here, six of these tubs. Uh, and, uh, because of what's in here, it's led me to believe that this place here was someone's prepper retreat. This was the place that someone was planning to come to. At this point, no one's come here. Uh, I would think that if they were going to get here, they already would have gotten here. So I think that the people that own this place are probably no more. Uh, and it's, it's kind of shocking that no one's come in here because I know people have come by. There was a data card that was left up there. But I guess, you know, you, you judge a book by its cover. It just looks like some kind of tumbled down shack. People figured there was no point in, you know, breaking the locks and coming in here. And um, <laughs> I'm glad they didn't because, again, six of these things. And they're packed the way that a prepper would have packed for air travel. They always said, like, if you're traveling with your family, you get a bunch of bags. Don't put all this, all your whatever in one bag because if you lose one bag, you're going to lose all that, that person's clothes. So you want to kind of spread people's clothes and essentials out across all the bags in case one gets lost. So six of these, they're all pretty much the same. Stuff spread out across it. And it is, uh, it's just a treasure trove. So let's, let's pop into this. It is absolutely amazing. Uh. The first thing that struck me when I opened these yesterday was, frankly, the smell. Uh, there is a little jar that they put in here. It's got uh, mothballs, and they 
put the lid on just kind of loosely there, I guess not to overpower it. I guess I have this to thank for there not being rodents in there. Then they have a bag over it, which I guess keeps the smell of the food that's in here in and keeps the smell of the mothballs out. So, all right, so right on top, and again, all six of these are fairly the same. Uh, there's a, a couple different uh, individual things in, in each of them. One of them is, uh, this is the only bin that had reading glasses. Uh, this person apparently needs reading glasses to read, so they, uh, they put these in there. I guess, I'm sure they have their own pair as well. This is probably a backup of theirs. Uh, right here is a, a journal and a pencil. And that, that's, pretty, that's a pretty cool idea. I hadn't actually thought myself about that, but that'd be a really nice feeling. I guess I've been doing these videos, or kind of my journal, but you know, to be able to, to write things down or take notes for yourself or even just draw or sketch, I think that would be a, a nice, a nice uh, asset to have, and I appreciate that I have it. Uh, there's a lot of books in here. Uh, there's these two right here, Survival Wisdom and Know-How and Country Wisdom and Know-How. And these are, well, these, these might explain why the reading glasses are in here. Uh, there's a ton of information in here, really small uh, text. It's all about uh, different types of cooking. In this one, what was that back here? It looks like uh, uh, how to make cooling coils different types of plumbing, all, all sorts of information. This is like homesteading. And this one is, well, more akin to what I'm doing right now is living off the land kind of stuff. There's a, you know, yarrow, different uh, types of um, edible plants, poisonous plants. Uh, so much information in these. I, you know, I, I think I probably know a fair bit of this, but uh, I'm definitely gonna bone up on this myself. There's all sorts of information in these two books. And uh, going down, there's a specific book on gardening. I think that's a really helpful guide to have. Uh, and then we get into some less practical books, but you know, these make a lot of sense too. There's just some reading. This is East of Eden by John Steinbeck. I actually uh, picked up uh, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, and I've read that a couple of times, so I wouldn't mind something a little bit different. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's uh, Dune is in here. I, th this seems like one of those books that it's kind of a big book, maybe They'd always planned on reading it, and they figured this would be a, a good time if they ever found themselves out here. And I'm guessing that these people had kids because there are a bunch of uh, Magic Treehouse books, a lot of them uh, here. And, you know, I, I'm going to be totally honest. I'm probably going to read these as well, <laughs> just for some variety. I, look, at it's the, the capers of the nights at dawn. You know, I'm, I'm excited to get into anything that's different, even if it's, uh, even if it's kids' books. Um, they've got this in there, Holy Bible. I, I'll be honest, this doesn't really have any value to me personally, although I'll, you know, I'll probably read through it. You know, it's, it's a book you always hear about, and honest to God, I, I've never read it, and I, I think a lot of Christians have never actually read it either. So, uh, you know, I'll probably make some time for that also. Uh, going down from here, it's a lot of food and, uh, you know, useful supplies. Matches, yay, right off the bat. I'm gonna treat these kinda as though I don't have them. There's uh, 50 books, each one has 20 matches in there. That's a thousand matches in here, although it looks like they maybe went in there, took out maybe one, one book a match. So it's 998, uh, 998, I, I, I can't do math right now. There's a lot of matches in there, psyched about that. A uh, Couple of things here that maybe aren't so useful for me. Um, I don't know what, these go to, but they, they don't go to my 9mm Glock, that's for sure. I don't know what the, the caliber of this is. It's uh, well, the, well, One thing is kind of interesting, and this is a good idea, they put a 20 uh, at the top, which I think uh, the idea there means that they got 20 rounds in here, because you can't really see how many rounds there are in here. Uh, so I guess that, that maybe that was their note to themselves, that these, these are both full and they have 20 rounds in them. Uh, so I guess these things maybe hold 20 rounds? I don't know. Apparently. So I, I, I guess I'm going to hold on to these for, you know, trade. I could trade them with someone so that person can then take them and shoot me with them. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, this, oh, actually, you know what? This is probably the caliber, whatever this is. 55, AR-556. 556, 45 millimeter, whatever that is. They've got a, a bunch of boxes of that. I, at least I assume that's the same thing. I don't know. It's not 9 millimeter, so it's not of any immediate use to me, whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of food in here. Um, there are pineapple rings, uh, a lot of sugar and calories. 
in that. That's great. Um, we got some uh, kind of granola bars, energy bars there. There are vitamins here. Uh, and that is a really cool asset to have because, uh, you know, you can get enough calories, but if you don't have the, the nutrition to go with it, you're going to be in trouble. So, so that's pretty cool. Uh, talk about calories. We've got olive oil, a whole thing of olive oil right here, and that's going to be really valuable. I can cook with that and, you know, the number of calories in here. You know, people always used to be afraid of this, but now these numbers are your friends now. Uh, there's 200 servings and each serving has 120 calories. That's an awful lot of calories that I'll be able to get out of this. And again, there's uh, five others of these in the other, the other cases. Um, these here are um, bags of uh, dehydrated vegetables. So I can use these you know, to make soups and things. Uh, each one's a pound, so it's two pounds of dehydrated vegetables. Some of the other ca cases actually had more than two of them in there. So it's pounds and pounds of vegetables. This is uh, chickpeas, also known as garbanzo beans. A lot of calories, a lot of protein in there. Uh, I've got, uh, looks like uh, pinto beans with maybe some black beans mixed in there. Here, another bag of that. Uh, down at the bottom, I, I kind of looked at this earlier. I, I tore through all these earlier. Uh, uh, this is a, a white flour. There's two 25, bag, uh, 20, two 25 pound bags of white flour at the bottom of each. So each of these cases had 50 pounds of flour in it. And uh, these are some uh, walnuts, a big thing of walnuts. Uh, and over here, here's, these are some interesting things. Uh, this is, can I get this open? Let's see if I can get it open. This looks like silver, like silver dollars or something. I know, you know, preppers were always talking about the idea of stacking silver as a way of, you know, you could barter uh, when the shit hits the fan. I mean, they're, they're awfully pretty, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know their actual value right now. Um, yeah, I certainly haven't come across anyone that I think would be looking for silver, but you know, certainly I'll hold on to that. Uh, so a bunch of pieces of silver in there. And this one, this is I've never actually held this in my hands before. This is, these are gold coins in this one. Got a little thing in the top there. Okay, a bunch of little gold coins. At least I, they seem to be gold. <laughs> it's like pirate treasure. So a bunch of a bunch of these. I haven't counted them. There's a lot in there. Again, you know, I I don't know the real value of some of this stuff because uh, you know I know what I'm looking for right now. You know, is food. But uh, you know, still it might have some value at some point. I think you don't really start thinking about uh, accumulating this kind of stuff until you know you have a surplus of this kind of stuff. Uh, speaking of other things that maybe don't have any value anymore, these are, that's money, a thousand dollars in 20. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars U.S. currency in, uh, in 20s. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know that anyone would trade anything for that other than for firewood at this point. But uh, I don't know. The uh, just through habit, I, I can't bear my. I, I, I can't bring myself to just burn them. So I will just hold on to those and you know, see what happens with them. Uh, last thing in here is uh, this is uh, uh, turkey jerky. I guess in here is a couple pounds of turkey jerky in each of these. So that is, uh, that's the deal with what I've got. I'm going to just kind of close this up for now. And I want to keep these closed and locked. Again, it's kind of surprising that no rodents got in there. I'm glad that they didn't, but I want to make sure that that continues to be the case. Uh, because, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, you could buy it for a dime a dozen before all this went down. But now it, it's worth, it's, it's, literally worth its weight in gold. And in fact, you know, all the silver that's in there, you know, I don't think anyone would even give me anything for that at this point. I certainly would not accept silver for, I, I would not, I will not trade any of this food for silver or gold or any.
I'm feeling like garbage today. I'm gonna try to speak up because otherwise what's the point of doing this video, but my head is just, it's just been throbbing. It's for, I, think, I think it's all day yesterday is this. All, it started the day before and I tried to, I tried to sleep overnight and uh, and then all day and then last night it just kept going and uh, and it's still going today it's no better in there I think it's actually worse in there because the roof is metal and it just it vibrates every hit it just vibrates uh, yeah, I, I took some um, I've got some uh, paper towels stuff I was using for my my feet I still got some more of that like napkins and things I, I got it in my ears but it's just you can feel it all over your body it's And, uh, and my foot, the one I stepped on the nail with. Uh, it started tingling yesterday. Uh, like the skin is sensitive around it. It's kind of red. And uh, the, the skin around it, like my foot, is starting to tingle a little bit. And that's not, a, that's not an awesome sign. So today, I'm not doing that great. I mean, the last time I did a video, I remember I was doing great. I mean, you can have all the shelter and the food in the world, but oh, I just can't sleep. And now I think I got an infection in my foot. And I just don't like, you know, I can't work. You know, I've... There's stuff I, 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 I should be doing right now, but I can't, I can't function. My head is just throbbing to the point where I'm feeling nauseous. And I'm try, trying not to walk on the foot. I don't know, maybe it would be good if I walked around and get the blood circulating. I, I don't know, but I don't feel like I can be functional right now. I think the last time that I did anything that was... You know, the last task where I actually accomplished something was uh, two days ago. I... Um, I got here, I thought about, you know, trying to keep the mice, trying to keep the mice out of things. So I was hanging things up and I had a bunch of short pieces of rope and I was able to uh, actually use the book that I found uh, to find out some actual knots. Uh, Cause I know how to do simple knots, but I found out how to do some actual knots to, uh, to tie stuff up and to join pieces of rope together. It really feels great to have access to all this food that I didn't have access to before. And I had a chance to try some of it just a little bit ago. And it's making me think that maybe mothballs aren't the best way to protect food from rodents. It did seem to keep out the rodents, but the food tastes a little bit like mothballs. I don't know if taking out the mothballs at this point is gonna do much good, but I certainly know that keeping them in there isn't gonna be doing me any favors. So what I've decided to do is remove the mothballs from the food and come up with a different way of trying to keep mice and rodents out of it. When I used to go camping, I would take my food and I'd put it in a bag and kind of sling a rope over a tree and haul the food up into a tree out on a branch so that bears couldn't get to it. Now, mice are kind of like little bears, so I'm thinking about using an approach sort of similar to that. Uh, specifically because one of the tubs had it quite a bit of rope in it. Now, I'm going to be using that rope and I'm going to be uh, creating slings with it and I'm going to use the slings to hang the tubs from the rafters in here. And to do that, I'm going to be using three different types of knots. The first knot that I'm going to be using is called a sheet bend knot. And the benefit of a sheet bend knot is it's really good at attaching different lengths of rope to each other to make them one contiguous piece. One of the best knots that you can use to tie together two different pieces of rope is the sheet bend knot. And it's especially good if you have two different sized pieces of rope. The way you do that is you take one of the ropes and if one's thicker, this will be the thicker piece, make a U shape like that. You take the smaller piece, pass it through the loop, 
wrap it around both pieces of the uh, the larger rope and then tuck it between itself and the larger piece. Snug that up and you've got a sheep bend knot. Really strong knot for tying together two pieces of rope. Again, especially if they're two different sizes. The next knot that I'm going to be using is called a bowline knot and I'm going to be using that to attach the pieces of rope to the physical rafters themselves so that I can suspend things from them. To make a bowline knot, you take your rope and you put it around whatever you want to tie to. In this case, I'm demonstrating this on a nail. And on the side that isn't the short end, you put a loop like this. Then you take your short side, put it through, wrap it around here, go back through the hole, and just like that, you've got a knot that's really good at holding tension in one direction like that. And the last knot that I'm going to be using is called a trucker's hitch. And a trucker's hitch is good for kind of cinching up on ropes and getting them uh, to be tight and hold things at tension. This particular tru trucker's hitch that I'm going to be using is really great because it's really easy to release later on. A trucker's hitch is a great knot that you can use to put tension on a line. I would oftentimes use it when I would go camping. I'd have a, a bowline uh, knot holding onto like a tent loop and then I'd use a trucker's hitch to attach down to like a tent stake or a tree or something like that. And we're going to use a tree in this case. Now if you were just going to try to tie down to a tree, you could just take the rope around and wrap it around the tree and kind of tie some kind of a knot here. But it's really difficult to get much tension into this. And even if you do get a lot of tension, and once you, once you tie the knot down, oftentimes it'll kind of loosen up as it rotates around the tree and stuff. So a trucker's hitch is a great way of tying down the way we can get a lot of tension. And the great thing about a trucker's hitch is, hitch is that it's really easy to release later on. It's not this nightmare to try to get it unraveled. So how do we start? Well, we don't start by going around the tree or the tent stake or anything like that at all. We start in the middle of the line right over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a little loop in the line. I'm just going to take the rope and fold it over itself just like that. So I've got this little loop. Then I'm going to get another loop here and just pass it up through. We're going to pull that and now we have a loop attached to our rope. Next, we're going to go around whatever we're going to tie down to. So I'm going to take the scrap end of the rope here, wrap it around that tree, and we're going to take, take that end that we just wrapped around the tree and we're going to put it through the loop we created. All right, pulling that back. And now here's where we can put that tension into the line. You can pull it nice and snug there. And there's an awful lot of tension you can put in there. So next thing we have to do is secure this down. So there are three ropes right here, two for the loop and then one for the rope that heads around the tree. We're going to pinch these three right here on this side of where we're, we're grabbing right there. So we're going to pinch these together kind of hold it all together and what we're going to do is we're going to take a loop in this rope right here and this, the fact that we're doing a loop is the key to what makes it easy to get rid of later on. We take a loop and then we just do a classic knot where we just go over these two lines here over and then through the little hole that's left there. Snug it up and there we go we got a lot of tension in that line and the great thing about this rope, uh, this knot in this rope, is that it's really easy to get rid of. Before I uh, demo how easy it is to release the tension in here, I would say that if you're going to ever make a line like this outside where it could be in wind and vibrating, you may want to take an extra loop and do just an extra knot in here as a little added measure of security uh, to make it so that uh, make sure that this doesn't loosen up on you. But uh, you know, generally speaking, unless there's a lot of like push and pull and everything, you know, you're not going to have to worry about it. Now, I mentioned that they're really easy to release these things. There's this little uh, loose end here, and just like with a, a, a shoelace and a tight shoe, you pull it out, and I'm going to be releasing that backup knot. Backup knot has just been released, and now I'm going to release the other knot, and the whole thing just comes apart that easily. So with the tub suspended from the ceiling, I have high hopes that I'm going to be able to keep the rodents out without poisoning my food so that it tastes like mothballs. Overall, I'm just super psyched. This is a huge windfall and things are feeling really, really great at this point. And I haven't really done anything since. I've just had a headache and my foot's hurting. And it's this. And That's 
one of them. I think that's it. That's actually one of them. That wasn't a person, that wasn't an animal. Please subscribe and tune in every week for new videos, and if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so through Patreon or PayPal.